The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this Michael. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Horde Hill, episode 98. I am one of the two hosts, Un, of the Duh. I am Le Gav and this is Le Dan. What is going on? I don't know, just, it, just, well, it just flows. Sometimes, man, when we get going, it just flows. It flows out of you, doesn't it? You see, back on it. You're back on it again. <laughs> hello, uh, everybody. Hello, how are you? I'm very good. How are you, Gavin? I'm good and I hope all you listeners are lovely and well as well. Um, we are getting gooey. We're getting sticky. We're getting ooey. We're getting slimy. Yeah, we're getting all creamy. I mean, and that's just normal. I mean, let's talk about what we're covering on the episode. No, the reason we've said all of that is because we are getting particularly <laughs> gross in this episode, and we're covering a couple of slimy 80s movies, aren't we, Gav? Yeah, this uh, I think this is your choice because these films are were kind of native to me as and I hadn't really checked them out before. Um I no, that's a lie. I reckon I've seen the blob once. Uh but I couldn't really remember it. So it's nice going back to these and the blob was fucking amazing and those effects were fucking incredible. Spoiler for my <laughs> review. So, so half spoiled there, we we're not really because I'm now gonna reveal we are covering uh, Yeah, sorry, the- sorry. The Stuff from 1985, yeah. Larry Cohen, a yeah. uh, very um, strange, unique film, which I cannot wait to talk about, and the remake of The Blob uh, from 1988. Yeah, the original, original being old Steve McQueen, wasn't it? Oh, yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah. We'll get into that. Um, so that's what we're doing in this episode. We're getting sticky and slimy, so expect lots of puns to do with, um, yeah. you know, that kind of... I do, and, and I do apologise if last episode's sound was a little bit different. It might have been a little bit quieter. I had a, a massive problem. The computer wouldn't turn on. I had to download. All it would do, download new operating system for Mac. And uh, then it turned on. So I didn't lose stuff. Um, but then I had to get back on and I had to go and use some other software and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so we should be uh, hopefully back on track now from now on. But Sounding as professional as mm. ever. I did have to buy a few bits and bobs though and spend about 140 quid in the end. So uh, actually, it's a very good point to say. Um, uh, thank you again to all the uh, patrons. Um, because that actually helped towards some uh, equipment I had to get for the computer. Uh, yeah. I had to get a new audio interface. Not that I necessarily need that for doing podcasting. Really. But it just goes to demonstrate um, genuinely what we would use money from patrons for, which is yeah. something fucked up. Well, I, mean, I, need to buy more well, I had to get a new so... pen tablet. My, the driver just didn't work for the my pen tablet. There's nothing wrong with my whack on pen tablet. So I have to use that because my hands for, um, hurt too much on, on mice, mouse, mice, mouse, mice. And, um, mice, mouse. Uh, so I use a pen to do that stuff. And uh, I had to go and buy a new one then. 40 quid. So for fuck's sake. For no, just because my computer didn't want to turn on. Anyway, that's boring shit. But to talk it's about. a good chance, like you said, to say thank you. To yeah, it patients. is. And I massively appreciate it because at the moment, I'm not really working. Uh, I've had this follow on effect of the, uh, the old COVID. So I'm not really working. So it's a massive appreciation uh, to you peeps for doing that. Totally appreciate it. So it's actually, guys, what that means for you patrons means is if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't really be. Well, we'd still be recording, but the, we wouldn't re- probably have quite the same quality, etc., that we we would normally. So, yeah. uh, indeed, yeah, yeah. Um, or it helps uh, speeding the episodes out a little bit quicker. Um, obviously, this one's a little bit delayed coming out, um, but it does help us get the uh, episodes out because I can work faster if I've got equipment which fucking works. It's as simple as that, you know. Okay. Only good as my tools. You good with your hands, aren't you, Gav? Oh, very good, my hands, Daniel. Now, mm-hmm. what? have you been watching you've been watching a netflix tv show yeah well you know you always say what have i been doing and i i'm such a fucking 
person to forget shit. Like, I, I just, I, I just watch stuff and I never remember it. I never note it down. Sarah's like, why don't you write it down? Yeah, I'll do that. And then I forget to the f- fact that I thought I'd write it down. You know, it's just... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, it's, I don't know how I get you in front of the microphone every every episode, to be honest, but well, I do it. Actually, stuff like this is... Uh, doing the podcast is actually comes kind of natural for me. It's literally like uh, my other arm or something. It's just, it just it's, oh, I've got to do that. I've got to do that. I've, I've seen do that. your third arm. Uh, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's out my back. Oh, okay. I meant the other one. Like a little tail. Yes. Uh, tell us, tell us about your Netflix. So show, yeah, please. so I haven't been uh, doing. A, uh, I'm making notes. Um, um, <laughs> I have been watching movies, but I haven't taken notes for what I've watched. Um, but yes, literally the past couple of days, I've been binging uh, season two of Sixty Days in a TV show, which is I'm fascinated by the human mind. This is quite often really why I'm doing the High Strangeness podcast with Sarah because we really get into the talking about the mind of killers and that shit. But um, this is about. Thank you. This is about six, maybe six people uh, of all walks of life um, going into a prison for 60 days undercover. And even the prison guards don't know. And you get the TV crew who happen to just be there just filming interviews with diff- different prisoners, but you only really see the edits of the individuals who are undercover. And It's like it's like Big Brother, but with shanking, isn't it? Yeah, there's no, there isn't actually any killing. These guys aren't... It's not generally it's guys and women. If I say guys, I say, I say male and female, uh, it's because it's both. It is both literally both sides. Um, it's not that. They're generally not killers. They're going to be like meth heads, um, uh, robbers, but fucking that sort of stuff. It's not generally murder. But still, their dudes are all of a sudden they're like, right, we're going to hold court. We think that you've been snitching. No, a group of them are going to get a guy and lash him. 40, yep. Forty lashes on his back. Or and it's just like this shit is mental, but I'm fascinated by these guys my, are undercover. My wife's been watching it. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, she, she, the episode I just because I've actually watched quite a lot of it over her shoulder, as it were, like when I'm just sat in the room. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the episode I just saw, there was a guy who has got takes multiple medications because he's got so many different sort of types. Of oh, that's season one. That's stuff. season one. No, she's on season two. Um, Ricky, his name was, and he ended up um, selling all of his drugs, which meant he wasn't on any of his meds. And then he ended up telling everybody in there that everybody on TV who touches their own hand on TV is admitting to him through a psychic channel that they're a child molester. And he says, like, I really want to go out and kill them because they're telling me. And then the guy that he's talking to looks at his hands and he says, oh, right. And he pulls his hands apart and he's like, yeah, I I just kill anyone who's a child molester. And this guy's thinking, this undercover guy's thinking, well, I sleep below you in the bunk bed, so I am not going to be getting a wink of fucking sleep tonight because you're going to try and kill me. It's, it's pretty weird. Um, mm. I don't know if I fully personally believe how much danger they're in. Um, I don't know if it's... Yeah, of course, it's going to be dramatised, absolutely. Scripted or dramatised. Uh, yeah. I'm not... It's not scripted. It, it, it's, it's too... It's too random a situation to be able to be scripted. You're, you're not in control of that situation. Uh, like one of the episodes I see a season I was watching like the, the sewer blocks up and it all comes back into all oh, the prison cells disgusting. and it's for that. like 30 hours but it's literally going all, all of them and one of the prisoners gets really ill because of the uh, the, yeah, the infection and they're talking to each other down through the toilets aren't they they, sort of, yeah. they figure out that you can use the toilets yeah, to communicate that, that is the season one block. that you're talking about by the way yeah, yeah. No, that is season one, but she's just finished. Season oh right, two. I gotcha. Um, yeah, um, so I've just been watching that because it's fascinating. It, it's it's real life. It's human life. Uh, it's in put into situations which uh, they're not used to. This one dude, this one poor guy, man. He's real white collar. He's like a lawyer or something, and he goes in straight away. They're like, "Hey, we like you," and doing all this to him. And they go walk into him completely naked. Hey, showing their cocks and stuff to him. All right. And one of them goes and that puts pulls his mattress up alongside him because he, he he goes and make he goes and puts his uh, mattress right where every person can see. Yeah, like he literally has no idea. He's got target written all over him, and then the pod, pod boss is just like, "Right, I'm fixated on you now," and just keeps going. I'm fucking, you know. And they're sort of saying, "You wait till you're asleep, boy, if you think that's bad." Like, there's one guy in season two who's like an ex bounty hunter and an ex cop or something and he is massive and as soon as he walked in they all yeah. no one fucked with this guy huge guy one just of, one one of them though goes what's this a green mole yeah yeah that's what he says to him yeah. isn't it he's a big black guy though he, yeah he's kind he's of a like retired, he's a retired police officer <laughs> um, um it's i actually have seen quite a lot of it um so i i agree with you it's definitely a it's fun fun interesting watch it's and the really whole point in the in the show is they're trying to um highlight that this, the system essentially see, is broken, no, no, the, the thing is though they're doing it for this one particular prison yeah 
And then the last season was the same prison. Um, you're basically just... they must It must be getting money for, obviously, the prison. And I guess some of the prison people are going to get some money from it as well. But you're basically saying the fault's in your fucking particular prison. You're literally telling the world, yeah, that shit, this is shit, that's what's going on there. You've got no fucking control. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, okay, thanks for the, the feedback. Of, Everybody the knows now. Drugs. They've got there's one scene in season two where the girls get a load of drugs and they're just up on not all night on crack, meth, and they're just having a massive party yeah, they, in one of their cells. Yeah, no they, one's yeah, giving a shit. Yeah. And they do shots of coffee and shit as soon as the lights yeah. go out to get going. It's mental. It's hilarious. But I've just been watching that, man, uh, that sort of stuff. What 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 canon of uh, amount of films have you been watching, dear sir? Well, relating to that, I've been watching a Netflix TV show. What one? Cobra Kai. Alright, so as far as I know, it, I see it's one of the dudes from Cry Kid. It's all of the people from Cry Kid. Okay. Every every cast member from Cry Kid shows up at some was point. Was there three Cry Kid movies, then a remake with Will Smith's Kid? There was four Cry Kid movies because they made they did one with he, uh, Hilary Swank called The New Karate Kid, where it was a girl, Mr. Miyagi. But three with Daniel Sun. Um, but this bit really only follows on from the first Karate Kid movie. And it's that whole fan theory of, actually, what if Johnny was the goodie and Danny was the bad kid that moved into the school, stole his girlfriend, picked fights with him, got his Japanese mates, beat him and his mates up, learned karate and kicked his ass in a tournament with an illegal kick. And it's kind of like Johnny. We pick up with Johnny 40 years later. He's a bit of an alcoholic. He's a handyman. He keeps getting fired from his jobs. Daniel is, like, cashing in on his tournament that he won by selling cars and he keeps saying we slash prices what you are what car and it's uh it, it's absolutely incredible and i'm not just like blowing smoke up, up his ass it's everything you've obviously got to be a karate kid fan but it's very nostalgic for the 80s it's got an amazing soundtrack and it really picks up right after the first movie really and they brought in so far they brought in pretty much every character from the original movies and they've just commissioned season three it's amazing and each episode's about 30 minutes long it's not too much of a, a slog um if you're a fan of the 80s or karate kid movie um it's amazing the guy that plays johnny the main guy it's actually all about johnny rather than daniel daniel was the main star in it but he is amazing in it and and they even bring back um Cobra Kai boss, his boss, Kreese, comes back into it as well. So everybody's in it. Obviously, Mr. Miyagi's dead, so he's not going to be in it. Um, unless they bring him back like an Obi-Wan Kenobi ghost or something. I don't know. Why have they uh, done a Karate Kid TV show? I don't know. Well, for the same reason they did an Evil Dead show, because people are nostalgic. People want to see... Yeah, Evil Dead, Evil Dead uh, had a pretty... Oh, I suppose Karate Kid did have that other Right, Kid's got out. it as well. I'll tell you what, Gab, um, this is, for me, this is actually better than the Evil Dead TV show. I did, uh, before getting on it, oh, okay, fair enough. I did, before getting on it, watch Night, an episode of Night Rider, actually, speaking of 80s. Oh, you've done a very good segue there, because I've got something Night Rider related to talk about next, but you carry on. Uh, and I, wa I watched the episode, um, oh, what's it called now? Was it the Halloween the one? Like a chameleon one, uh, Night of the Chameleon. And it's, oh, yeah. it's uh, this guy who could change his face, and he changes his face, and he looks like Michael Knight. So Michael Knight's versus Michael Knight almost. Oh, <laughs> That's it. We're trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> if you put a vocalization, it sounds like you're a, a drunk dog. <laughs> or, but so you have to go. Michael, might I suggest using the turbo boost as we hit this ramp? What is the point of the turbo boost? Why does it? No, not, no, no, that's, excuse me. Let's restep that. There's no point in me saying that. I mean, what is the, why does it jump up when it goes? Because the boost boosts it along. Why does it go up? <laughs> it goes up. It's why does it go, why? <laughs> It's the same reason the 18 van, when it <laughs> crashes for a fence, it has to be about 20 feet up in the air. There's no reason. It just does it. Street Hawk. Street Hawk, Street Hawk. Hits, a, hits a bump and it flies through the air 100 miles. Must have just been like these little fly-offs all over the place. Speaking of fly-offs, <laughs> there you go. It's a segue. I've been skateboarding a little bit recently. I got myself a new set of wheels and I've been out on my little skateboard. And uh, Have you injured yourself? No. Uh, but fucking totally shit scared my ankle at any point. It's just going to go vroom and just turn to like rub plastic man and I was going to fall over. Rubber. What was man. that cartoon back in the day, the 80s cartoon? Is it Plastic Man? Plastic Man. Yeah. yeah. See? Plastic Man. Well, talking of Night Rider, that that brings me nicely into a documentary that I've watched recently. Uh, with a guy Rider. who... 
Uh, and that, well, it's the guy that was in Knight Rider. He was also in The A Team. He was also in Dukes of Hazard. He was also Die Magnum Hard. PI, Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, Big Trouble in Little China, Bill and Ted, and a bunch of other movies. What and this interesting is, uh, idea to have a documentary. He's the guy that when we such... he's popped up, we have before you get into before you introduce it, uh, uh, we've sort of in Big Trouble in China. We've sort of mentioned him before in films we've recovered. And we say, oh, that dude, oh, blah, 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 that dude, oh, he eats a Twinkie or whatever it is. Oh, wicked, you know. Yeah, got him. So it's called Henchman, the Ao Leong story. Now, Ao Leong, for anybody that doesn't know, is the Chinese guy with a bit of a Fu Manchu goatee, long hair, bold on top, who shows up in a bunch of movies in the 80s and 90s. He famously played Endo in Lethal Weapon. He was the guy that ate the chocolate bar in Die Hard. Um, he was uh, Genghis Khan in Bill and Ted. And he's been in so many movies. He was one of the main guys in um, The Baddies in Big Trouble in Little China. He dies twice. I'm pretty sure he dies twice in Big Trouble in Little China. He's in Big Trouble in Little China about five times. Ah! Uh, they interview John Carpenter in this documentary. They interview loads of people uh, there's even interviews with brandon lee obviously he's dead but they got some interviews with him from behind the scenes and stuff and it's an incredible documentary about someone that me and my dad always referred to as goatee man because goatee man would always show up in all the movies we love and uh it's great and they sort of talk about how he's only ever killed by the main person in the film whether that's um john uh, John McClane or uh, Martin Riggs or um, any of the movies he's been in Brandon Knee kills him so in one of the movies so it makes him a little bit cut above the others doesn't it uh, and he's even in the Godzilla the 98 Godzilla movie and he was the first person to get killed the, by the, Godzilla the Roland Limerick one <laughs> yeah and he was the first person to get killed by Godzilla which I didn't even know he was in that that and uh, um, I still know what he did last summer in my two uh, little movies that no one else likes I, I love Godzilla I love like Godzilla should we, know, well, just, Should we cover it? Should we cover it? Let's cover it. Yay. It's horror. Um, so this, what's endearing about this documentary, it's quite low production. Sometimes the sound is a bit weird, uh, but it's on uh, a Prime. I've got Prime at the moment. Um, I'm just trialing it. Uh, I had yeah, to rent cool. it for a couple of quid. But um, it, it's, it's, it's really good. If you like your 80s movies, you'll love this. But what's endearing about it is... Um, he actually got brain cancer in the late 80s, early 90s and was told he would die, fought back from it. Then they got a phone call from Brandon Lee who said, do, do you want to be in my film, fighting me at the end? And he was like, yeah, all right. Then made films for another 10 years. Always his pas passion was always motorcycle racing. <laughs> but even though he's a stunt man and a kung fu expert. Um, and then he, he had a stroke about five years ago and he's still cracking, he's still going now. Uh, and there's interviews with him. He's, he can't talk quite as well as he used to because of his stroke, but oh, it's a really endearing, really fantastic documentary and I can't recommend it enough. And it's called Henchman, the Owl the Young story. It came out two years ago. That's really pretty, good. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to do a follow on for that, something I have watched, which uh, I mentioned on my other show. Um, uh, actually, Sarah and I checked out the Danny Trejo documentary and that is a couple of quotes oh, yeah. on Amazon Prime and I definitely recommend that to you Dan and all you it's lovely called, listeners it's called like Prisoner or, or I can't remember what it's called uh, now Convict or something like that isn't it yeah he's got uh, Inmate Number One I think it is that's it um, it's really good documentary it's really well worth watching um, yeah really interesting just seeing how Danny Trejo decided one day in prison that he's just like eh, fuck this what's the, what's the point of being bad I'm going to be good and just start helping people and turning down money no nope, I'm just going to help people for free and because of that he got into acting it was... he, he's almost like Al Leung isn't he in that he shows up in so many movies as a henchman yeah. sometimes he gets the lead role probably bigger than Al Leung but uh, he's that kind of face that you recognise you see him in the background you know it, something's about to go down when he shows up. I can't remember where it was. It's Coke or Heroin or something, but he first got on it when he was like 11. Yeah, he was um, um, a really bad yeah, person. And, but now, he still does it now. He go, he, he goes all around the country at uh, uh, drugs rallies as a spokesperson. He goes into yep. prison speaking to them all. He, for, like, quite often for free, he just does it because he just wants to help. He just literally, in prison, decided, I don't want to be bad, I'm going to be good. And literally, I'm going to start being good. And he's made his... What you see about these... He's an amazing example as a human being. Uh, if you just change your mindset in a certain way and go for more positive, you know, you can, not, you can outreach and goodness will come back to you in different forms. And he um, He's a very uh, inspirational... Inspirational, absolutely. ...person, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, uh, do you remember that funny story about him being on the set of, I think it was Dust Till Dawn, where him and Rod- Robert Rodriguez realised they were actually cousins? Yeah, he, uh, Robert Rodriguez is on it, and he actually mentions that. Yeah. That's hilarious, isn't it? It's like, oh, hang on a minute, we're related. Yeah, he, yeah he's, he's interviewed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, worth watching. Yeah. Well, I also watched a movie which I know that a lot of people have been wanting me to watch. Uh, you and RJ McCready also really wanted me to watch this. So I finally got around to watching Nicolas Cage, Nicolas Cage. in uh, The Collar Out of Space. Ah, okay. I don't like the ending. Um, okay. I don't want to spoil it. Uh, it's just, it didn't, just didn't really work for me. It kind of was just like, oh, okay. So, yeah. um, but I did not know that was your opinion on it. Um, but I um, do enjoy the film. I settled down with the lights out. And it's a colourful uh, movie. Magen- Magenta. On. Yeah, I think. So, yeah, colour. Magenta. Magenta, that's it. And I actually was blown away by it. Um, it is probably one of the best uh, visual treats I've had in a very long time. Um, yeah, it's gorgeous. It also yeah. really terrified me. A couple of scenes, I, I didn't know where it was going. Yeah, there's a, there is some bits in it. I'm just like, there's a bit on a sofa. There's a yeah, sofa. oh my gosh. And, I was saying to RJ that for that me, that's really that, appalled me, actually. It kind of goes into sort of different realms of uh, uh, films I don't like, more body horror sort of stuff. Um, it's H.P. Lovecraft it's, as well. It's Lovecraft, so yeah, that's what you get. Um, and also really... Um, there's some moments around loss which really cut me deep as well I was just really blown away by it what I liked about it the most I think was actually not just the effects and the colour and the, the music and everything but also I thought Nicolas Cage was fucking phenomenal in it uh, he really he played his Nicolas Cage dialed up to a 12 but also did it it fitted into this world so well because there was a reason for him to act like this I just thought it was an incredible film yeah, uh, really it was, wasn't expecting. I thought it was going to be overhyped. It oh, well. was gorgeous looking, and it was just like I'm really proud of Richard Stanley um, after what went on with the Island of Doctor Monroe. I know. I was shocked that it's the same director. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. British director, um, and he's he's a massive stoner. He's uh, into taking. Mushrooms, and hallucinogenic. Yeah, and stuff, yeah, yeah. He spent he spent a year. Really, he, he got saying from watching this. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Doctor Doctor Moreau, that movie. If you haven't watched the documentary of that, how that all went, fuck, fucking tits up. Check that shit out. That's just insane. Where he that came back really on as an extra, undercover uh, of his own movie. He had been fired as a director, and uh, they had to pay him uh, contract obligations. They had to pay him his full fee, and he I think he went and sat on, like on a mountain for like a year. Um, with a, a glow in the dark Ouija board and just doing shit like that, just and hit him and Val Kilmer at one point went missing off the set and they were found in the jungle in their pants, just smoking really high grade weed during the making of that film. It's like fucking hell. I'm pretty hell. sure him and Nicolas Cage, uh, not not together, all both went looking for the Holy Grail at one point. Yeah, they have. No, they are. that's one of the facts on the what IMDb. A, what a strange thing. Can and you so, that but on the, the set? But it's almost like this movie. <laughs> this, see, we we will have to cover this movie because just think about now. Those two, that director and that actor, both of them two, Richard Stanley and Nicolas Cage. That is quite a combination. They should work together again. Can you imagine uh, how that went on set where um, Richard's like, hello Nicholas, I'm looking forward to working with you. You know, one time I went looking for the Holy Grail and Nicholas Cage is like, yeah, me too, I never found it though. Yeah. Like, what, what the, the fuck? fuck? <laughs> 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 Just... We are covering it, Gav. We are covering it because um, we are doing a Nicolas Cage episode. Okay. Uh, in the next, probably in the next 10 episodes or so, it's going to be Mandy and Colour Out of Space. A little sneak there for our listeners, but Mandy and Colour Out of Space, a couple of crazy, wacky Nicolas Cage horror I'd, movies. I'd fucking... And he's really getting into his horror lately. Which I know, I'm, I'd, I'd fucking love to. So well. I'd love to put him in something. I'd love to do something with Nicolas Cage. He's incredible. Now, talking of H.P. Lovecraft, the other film I very wanted to watch, the last one, um, was another Lovecraft movie, which I watched only a couple of nights ago. And it's, again, another fucking visual treat. Uh, black and white. Uh, and we are talking about The Lighthouse. Great film. Fucking hell. That, that was... I thought I'd seen it all with Colour Out of Space, but actually The Lighthouse was 
one of the most insane, visually insane films I've seen. It was just, it changed my opinion about, um, what's his name? Uh, Robert, uh, uh, no, no, no. Um, well, what's his name? The, the Batman. Huh? What's the Batman kid called? I can't remember his name. Oh, the uh, the main the main dude. That's uh, uh, Patterson, isn't it? Um, Robert, Robert Patterson. Patterson. Yeah. Uh, him. It changed my mind about him. I've always known that Willem Dafoe is fucking mental, but this this film was just out there, and it's beautifully shot, and it's in it's that gorgeous. weird ratio, isn't it? What's that? What's that really weird square ratio? That's the old. Uh, 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 I can't remember the actual numbered ratio parts, but that's the old box like for TV and stuff. Uh, they were just definitely going for that that look. I'm amazed that they were able to do that look, and they said, "Yeah, okay, you can do that." He's got such um, this aspect ratio is one nineteen to one. Um, it just looks weird because it's so square. The sound mix. Uh, was originally mono but they did change it to dolby digital so that's quite funny and uh, they just literally said yeah we're gonna go like old school like you know uh what you're looking at mid 20s mm, yeah i'd say early to mid 20s filmmaking um 19th century obviously oh, 18th century no 19th century um so yes bizarre really uh, and what did you think of the lighthouse you liked it i think it's brilliant um it's such a strange movie but it's so hypnotic i've watched it at night time quite often and it's been pretty you know lights out just sitting there watching it and it's 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 i don't know i really enjoy i like the fucking strange dynamic of the two of them and the dialogue and the weirdness is which is going on and i don't know i like robert eggers films I'm, i don't know about this new one do you know what he's doing the viking movie uh, no, I don't. I don't know about this. He's already shooting it at the moment. Um, I'll tell you the name in one second. I, I actually didn't like it as much as Witch. Um, the I North still think. Oh yes, I have heard about this. Yeah, sorry. No, Viking Revenge Saga set in Iceland at the turn of the. And it's all going to be century. in the original tongue, apparently. Yeah, well, uh, all these films have been. Well, as, as they've been in a tongue. Um, obviously, the lighthouse was not. There's no particular original tongue but, for that. But he was very but, specific. Yes, about and their the witch, accents. the witch, exactly the same. So, he is. Yeah, Nicole Kidman's in it. I still really prefer the witch because there's something about that. I for me, that's witch. like a modern classic. The, I think there's something um, that is such an incredible film. The, the, there's going to be a witch in this new movie, and it's played by Bjork. Oh, perfect. <laughs> what the fuck? That's fucking perfect. Uh, Bjork is a, again, speaking of like good, uh, like perfect combinations of directors and actors, Bjork and Robert Eggers. Yep, I'm with that. I'm all over Ethan that. Ethan Hawke, William Dafoe. Like Willem Dafoe again, brilliant. Yeah, right. and Alexander Skarsgård uh, yeah, uh, I love is him. the uh, main dude. So I'm, yeah, of course I'm going to watch this shit. Because um, he was going to do Nosferatu, wasn't he? Well, I think he's still, that's still on the cards, but uh, he keeps finding these other projects. He's been spoiled at the moment because people are just throwing money at him. You know, make another movie, make another movie. Which so. is interesting because he's not making traditional films. And they're probably not making a huge amount of money, these movies. You know, they're not box office no. movies, are they? I, but, I'm uh, really proud that... Uh, well, proud. I'm really happy that uh, these films are being made. And, yeah. Uh, uh, by, 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 uh, by very good artists, you know. These they, are films that... Um, they're very, there's a real callback to just making films for, the, for art's sake, isn't there, yeah. with these movies? Yeah, you know, exactly. with, with, yeah. with, with this and with um, Colour Out of Space, they're not necessarily going to make shit loads of money but they're, they're being made because well, the person that's making them has got a lot of love for the horror of it or, or just film generally well they're not pop so you're not going to get the uh, weekend box office thing going on but at the moment who the fuck is anyway with what's going on in this world so the, these go. these films if they go on iTunes or whatever and you can rent them people will rent them and stuff because it's quite easy just to sit at home go fine let's fucking watch a movie now and because of coronavirus that is going to be a lot more than normal the percentage of people at home happily renting hopefully rather than just downloading legally because I know everyone downloads I understand it it happens well not everybody do you know what I mean um, and that's never ever going to go away anywhere um, 
but you can rent stuff fairly cheap you know some shit's not too bad um, i rented the lighthouse on prime for a couple of quid um, yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. i wanted to give up give back you know and yeah i keep meaning to watch parasite and that's on there for like two quid and it's just kind of like being at a video shop again it kind of gives you that little feel do you know what i mean two quid like, yeah, yeah cool. i love that yeah uh, some of the I new thought. movies come out there was one uh, king of staten island i think it was called king of staten I don't know um and that was like but it was, it was it's, you're sort of looking at like 14 pounds to rent it which is like mm. it's like oh my my cinema was only five pound <laughs> yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't worry about that yeah so um, i did watch it but i didn't down i didn't legally download it but i just didn't watch it do you know what i mean i'm like well i've got access to like so much shit amazon prime netflix uh shadow yeah I have been watching some stuff on the Disney Plus channel. Um, the X got the Disney Plus channel, so Elijah and I sat and watched Monsters Inc., Monster University, and Cars. And he loved Monsters so much we had to watch Monsters University twice, which is so nice in this day and age because it, all the kids nowadays are fucking YouTube channel surfers, you know. Well, I mean, so, back when we were kids, we'd watch we the same watch film the every whole, weekend. Exactly, and I was really happy that he did that and stuff, you know. You know, I was saying, to, I think I was saying to RJ McCready when I was on his show a few episodes back, back in the day, you'd rent a film and you had it for 40 hours. I'd probably try and watch it two or three times in those two days you, before yeah, we you, took it back to yeah. Blockbuster. Well, that's just, we didn't really have the advantage we do now. So I was really happy that you did that. Anyway, this Not is but... a half an hour introduction. Can we get into this episode? Of course. Well, before, I've got a couple of very, very important messages yeah um before we go into our first review but before i do that i just want to bring it down a level by letting you know about one other film i watched called terror dactyl yep and imagine from 2016 uh okay prehistoric eggs come flying from outer space and land on earth giant pterodactyls come to earth in search of them and they just start eating people and destroying buildings and uh the effects are fucking brilliant. The acting is terrible, but actually, this film was so much fun, and and the I was really impressed at the effects. But um, that's all I wanted to say, really, because um, everyone likes to hear about me talk about shitty movies I've watched. I, Pterodactyl. I'm gonna have to then do this disclaimer. I'm really sorry to do this, but I watched a movie you loved and I disliked. And last episode, you said to everybody, "It's phenomenal," and it's eight out of ten. Talk about the shed. And I, I'm going to have to say to everybody, I didn't like this. I'm not going to suggest watching it. And I'm really sorry, Dan. That's the shed, isn't it? Yeah. You loved it, though. But I, I understood why you loved it. It has that 80s vibe. There's a couple of scenes in it I really did dig when it's just in the shed. But there's a lot of, a lot of fluff in it. I was a bit like, oh, come on, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, but I'm saying you haven't. No, no, no. It's cool, man. I, I, I appreciate that because Bo... Uh, Bo Ranzler did the he same thing. Like it, I recommended really. it to him, and he he really didn't like it either. So, actually, I think it's really splitting. I've realised it's really splitting people who are horror fans. Yeah, I I absolutely loved it. It blew me away for a low budget yeah. horror movie. I had a it did. I don't know what it was about it. It really did something for me. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that's you and Bo now, that, who I really respect your opinions, both of you. And yeah, it's uh, it's not hit home with you guys for some yeah, reason. Yeah, I know. It's fine, man. I, I, I felt really bad though. But then you know the same for me. Like first time I watched Hereditary, as I famously said, I fucking hated it. And then I rewatched it recently, yeah, yeah. and I absolutely loved it. So yeah. I think you've got to be. I'm not saying you weren't. Maybe you're just never like the shed. But I think you've got to sometimes you just like a film or you don't really and that's life isn't it really absolutely and everybody likes things for different reasons like the, there's going to be certain things that like to me go I really enjoy that so it's really and the certain you get you pick out different well, things out, sometimes but, but, look at me and you we fucking love American World from Paris we did a review of it on our show and everybody Loved most it. people hate that sh that program <laughs> that film and I feel bad because other people went on to go on and watch it and I, I, I have no idea if they enjoyed it or not because they never came back <laughs> <laughs> they've left they've, they've left, left the country or whatever country <laughs> they're in <laughs> Well, it just goes to show if you like something you like yeah. something but, so you know. I'm I'm going to have to go though uh, Podcast on a Haunted Hill is split between if you want to watch The Shed check out The Shed if you don't want to check out The Shed don't check out The Shed and that's no, the, that's really my like last for, thoughts on it you know um, right. Well, before this... our first review I have very quickly want to let everybody know yep. as we as you've explained this is episode 98 we've got a couple of episodes to go and then we hit our 100th episode which is a milestone Yeah. Um, we want to remind everybody that we'd really 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 love of it if a you would love you would leave us a voice clip or send us an email yeah, or a 
or a message or something to either be read out or something that we can play um whether you sort of just saying well done on hitting 100 or guys give up 100 is the magic number or whatever it is a question an impression you can just anything say you, you can write. record literally going twats and that could be it we play it we will we're play it. happy with twats <laughs> we're happy with twats <laughs> Um, it's the podcast on Haunted Hill at Outlook.com. Nice That's easy. If you want to send us an email or alternatively, if you want to just PM us on Facebook or whatever it is you want to do, please do that. And the other thing is as well, we're, we're gaining momentum with our with Patreon and the amount of listeners and the followers we've got. We'd love it because we do only have a few reviews. We'd love it if some if some of you guys could put a review on any of the various platforms that we're on. And whether spread that's the seed. Or anything else. Spread the seed, spread the love, spread the funky blob stuff. Spread the juice. Right. Let's, let's get sticky. <laughs> let's get sticky. Well, we're going to start off things with the stuff, aren't we? So let's have a little trailer and we'll yep. come back and talk about 1985's The Blob. What? <laughs> stuff. The stuff. <laughs> All right, be back soon. This is not a test. This is the Psychosemantic Podcast. Announcing the commencement of the annual purge sanctioned by the U.S. government. Weapons of class four and lower have been authorized for use during the purge. All other weapons are restricted. Government officials of ranking 10 have been granted immunity from the purge and shall not be harmed. A few days ago, I called the news the enemy of the people, and they are. They are the enemy of the people. We have Ben Jacobs, that's the Guardian reporter, body slammed tonight by the Republican candidate Greg Gianforte. Living with a six-year-old. I'm not able to uh, be rushed this fast. It makes me nervous. Well, then you two learned a very important lesson today. Cops don't help. The head is one big pile of shit. It's a prey! Can you fly, Bobby? In the 20th century, the Senate voted on seven Supreme Court nominees during election years, and it approved all but one. So just to, just to put a button on this, are you ruling it out 100%? Yeah. Are you crazy? Is that your problem? Politics, movies, political movies. The Psychosemantic Podcast. Better known as the Psychosemantic Cast. The show is here now. We interrupt this presentation with the following urgent message. Tonight, America is in grave danger. We are under alien attack by a popular dessert known as The Stuff. Here, Jason, take some. No, don't eat that. There is something alive in there. Tasty. There's something alive in yogurt. It's called benign bacteria. If the stuff is in your house, do not eat it. If you have it on your shelves, do not sell it. If you distribute this material, close your doors, make no more sales. Enough. It's never enough. And we are here for our first review in this sticky episode. So we're looking at the stuff from 19, <laughs> the stuff from 1985, a delicious, mysterious goo that oozes from earth, from the earth, is marketed as the newest dessert sensation. 
But the tasty treat rots more than your teeth when zombie-like snackers who only want to consume more of the strange substance at any cost begin infesting the world. Quite a long one, that one. Mm. Quite a long one, that's what she said. Um, the stuff, what can we say? 1985, Larry Cohen, director Gav. That joke's always going to be used for everything. That's what he said, that's what she said, that's what the vicar said, that's what... Fucking whoever said the farmer said, you know, it's always going to be used, isn't it? It's always going to be used, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've not seen this before, so my first watch. Oh, uh, really? Mm hmm. Okay, That's wow. That's not bad at the beginning. Oh, I, th- I thought you just hadn't seen it for a very long time. No, that's the blog. I've seen once. So, so Larry Cohen, um, he's been within the horror industry for absolute years. He doesn't stand a lot of directing. Passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. There's a good documentary on him, actually. It's on Shudder, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, I did not know. I, I like Larry on him. Cohen. Yes, there is. I like Larry Cohen. The fact that he is, was a uh, punk rock uh, filmmaker. Uh, I like to look at myself upon that way. Um, the kind of um, let's just get it fucking done. It doesn't matter. Just we're not. We haven't got permits, but fucking just run over there with a the camera and we'll just fucking shoot it. Um, I like the fact that he did that. And this movie I find interesting because regardless of budget he makes it large on scope god it feels huge doesn't it it makes it um, feel like world war z it, it's um as in like ge- geographically ge- geographically do you know what i'm saying yeah yeah there's a lot of traveling around and it does um a really good job of tying together lots of different elements and at times the editing is a bit jarring when it bounces between mm. different things that's happening what i like what pulls it all together for me is is the main uh, hero, I suppose, who is unlike any sort of hero. Yeah, we get onto, we're definitely onto him. Um, it's only sort of hour and twenty-seven minutes. Um, I actually found that I felt it dragged uh, in the sort of going into the uh, the end of the second act, sort of going into the third act. I just felt it was just dragging a bit, and it's only an hour and a half long. Um, apart from that, I did enjoy the movie. Um, it's it's a quite an interesting film, isn't it? It's like it's like George Romero with his commentary with shoppers and stuff like that and zombies and for sure, for sure. This is consuming, definitely quite, you know. It's all about consumerism. This isn't it. Mm. Uh, it's really um, interesting. Before we <clears throat> before we discuss it too much, I just yeah. want to make an announcement, which is this is a milestone. This is our two hundredth review. Oh, so this is this is the two hundredth movie that we've reviewed in ninety eight episodes in seven, just almost seven years. So I just wanted to let you know that that, that is quite the milestone. We've cooked, we've reviewed two hundred movies. You can always class us as film reviewers, can't you? Really, you could almost, yeah, <laughs> almost. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that. Uh, that's kind of cool, man. That's that's yeah, two hundred notes we've written. You know. Yeah, that's mental, isn't it? My favourite note is still going to be uh, Sharon Stone. I knew you were going to go there. Yeah. Ham sandwich. Sharon Stone uh, opens her legs. I buy into my ham sandwich or whatever it was. Oh no, Michael Douglas yeah, that... goes. Michael Douglas went down on Sharon Stone. I I ate into my ham sandwich. Yep, blew my mind. That did. Yeah. There we go. Out of two hundred <laughs> movies that we've reviewed, that's what you fucking love. Eating that's the note. No, that's, that's the that's the funniest <laughs> note I think I've ever had. You know, uh, to look down on. Well, let's get back to the stuff. Yes, it's about consumerism. Uh, it's about excessive sort of shopping and wanting. And I feel like this is a movie that yes. George Romero, or dare I say it, John Carpenter would have done yeah, really good. Like, like, well. Yeah, absolutely. Was yeah, it's definitely it. got that feel to it. In fact, this probably yeah. would work well with They Live as a Double Bill. Mm-hmm. In fact, mm-hmm. uh, and then you could replace quite easily. You could replace the stuff in this with um, Coca Cola, or, or even cocaine, um, because people could become addicted to it and start acting in, in a different way and wanting it more and more and more and thinking that they're living a particular life when everyone who isn't doing what they're doing thinks what the fuck is wrong with you i can't believe the beginning of this movie this dude he must be pissed out of his face to just go along and go what's this white shit i'm gonna put it in my mouth like there's no time i've ever been that drunk i don't even drink anymore but i was ever that drunk i thought found white sticky substance on the floor and i've gone i'm gonna stick my finger in that and stick that in my mouth i've Never. been there you've been there I've- I've been in a few gay bars in Bristol and I thought, well, that, what's that? The whole floor was like it. There's a, Ger- yeah. there's a club in Germany like that, I think. Oh, yeah. 
Hmm. And I think they, 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 they do a thing where they run along and jump for it, slide for it. Oh, what? Through jizz? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Germany, what? have a word with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, no. Well, let's, let's start as we mean to go on at the beginning. So do, this, do, you think, this... do you think people have listened to this but they're in the car on the school runs and shit? I hope not. I really hope not. If they are, then young Johnny sat in the back seat. Don't forget your nine times table. Nine times nine is 81. Well done. So if you had nine men in the German club, times... Right, enough of this. 69. So, yes, we start... We just get, get straight into this movie, don't we? And it is very, it feels very rough and ready, like a Romero or a Carpenter movie. Very punk rock, like you said, Gav. It's a good way to describe it. And we just start off with, straight away, some security guard walks over, sees some weird shit on the ground, and goes, oh, I'm going to see what that tastes like. <laughs> he just eats it straight away. Oh, oh it's delicious. Oh. So his mate over. comes over. What are you doing? Oh, I've got this stuff. You should check it out. Oh, yeah, all right, then. It, it, uh, no, who are these guys? Never go down the pub with them. You'll be up to all sorts. Go on, have a, just have a little bit of that. Go on. <laughs> You'll be eating what, and nibbling what is it? everything. Dunno. Coming to the toilets. I found something under the toilet seat. What is it? I don't know. I don't know, but taste it. Oh, yeah. What is that? And it starts, it starts bubbling. And they go, and even when it starts bubbling, they're like, oh, yeah, it's so sweet. What mm, I love is, lovely. love is jump ahead. And we're now selling it. How did that happen? <laughs> We're missing out a bit of a story here, peeps. What's going on? Because this, this guy went, oh, I'm going to have to phone someone up here about this. Yeah. Tell yeah. them how good, how delicious this stuff is. Uh, can, can we see the forms from the, uh, you know, the, the say, people who but... tested it out, make sure it's, it's right for public consumption? No, nah, no, nah, don't worry about it. Just try it. Oh, yeah, it's good, actually. Say, he says, we could sell this. It's so good. And so that, that's all we need. Yeah, there we go. Suddenly, it's, it's a product. It's, it becomes it's, a real product. It's, what an interesting movie to have the story really set after it's become a product, a fine product, after it's become a product, and now this dude just wandering around is like an investigator taking t- fucking payoffs from different companies, and they're actually coming through with it, and they know that they're, they're, he's not going to come through with it. Just take this money and fuck off with you. Stop, stop fucking nosing around here. It's such a random movie. It really is. It, it, it's a very strange plot, isn't it? It's, it's all really about. Weird. Trying to get the recipe, essentially, you could, again, it's you could Willy replace Wonka. this Coca-Cola or Willy Wonka, and it's it's trying to get the recipe for a product that everybody loves. So they they hire a mole, yeah, who's an ex-FBI agent. It could be the story of one of the moles in the Charlie and Chocolate Factory. Imagine that. That'd be weird. The creepy one, the creepy fella, the one that looks try, like try the one that looks this. like a bit of a pedo. I mean, you think he's yeah. gonna do so? You think he's gonna pull his pecker out? Yeah, the one he's got. The, I know the one you mean. The one who sort of. He's always following Charlie Bucket around, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I know the one you mean. Dirty Watch out, Peter. Charlie. I've got a golden ticket. Here's your golden ticket, Charlie. Oh, don't want to know what his golden ticket is. No. So we cut to um, a kid in bed. Uh, oh, God. What's that? What's that? <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally the worst fucking bridge to, to get us to travel over. Terrible. And uh, he wakes up in the middle of the night. He's really hot, and but he's thinking. Oh, what's I the best thing? Good. What's the best thing? Connection between him and my son. They both have the exact same bedspreads. Do they? Yeah, that bedspread he got the Return of Jedi ones, the one that I had as a kid, and uh, it's on Elijah's bed right now. It's the exact oh, same one. Or sort of. Oh, yeah. I'm really stoked on that. The, the only bedspread of mine I've ever seen in anything is. I've still got at my parents' house my A-team bedspread. Sweet. And Mr. Bean fucking has the same bedspread. I was going to say, I I thought you were going to say you've got a Mr. Bean bedspread. I was thinking, hang on, Mr. Bean came out in the (laughs) 90s. Like, what? No, I've got an A-team one that Mr. Bean happens to have in the TV show. You're bringing girls back to your parents' house when they Uh, go in there and you've got your Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean, no. You get down to action, you start just doing Mr. Bean impressions. It's my, it's my king. That, the trouble is, with that bedspread, that would work as an adult because you you could say things like, uh, oh, no. you, as, as you finish, you could say, I love it when a plan comes together. Oh, oh I thought you were going to say a lot of Mr. Bean. No, 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 the 18 bedspread. Yeah. You could or you do. could say, I ain't getting on a plane, fool. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if that works so much in post coitus. Some but... girls might like that. <laughs> Look, let's get back to the stuff. We've not so even talked this, about this movie yet, come on. So this kid wakes up in the middle of the night and he goes downstairs and he opens the fridge and he sees that they've got a jar of the stuff. 
mm. in the first, and it seems to be oozing and moving on its own. The, the pot design's great. It's great, very 80s, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That neon pink. Um, and his dad wakes up and he says, what are you doing? What are you doing up at this time of night? And he says, oh, dad, it's uh, the yogurt, the stuff. It's like oozing, it's, gr it's gross. This, this film actually made me hungry. I'm sure this movie shouldn't make me hungry because people are dying from it, but I actually got uh, eaten it. After I was like, I want a pot of the stuff now. It does make you want to kind of eat I want you some marshmallow but... fluff. You know that shit? Yeah, my oh. friend bought me some Stay Puft marshmallow fluff for my birthday, and yeah. it was... I threw it away. I, I didn't like it. Right, very prosthetic. But I wanted some of that while watching this. I was literally like, I want some now. So it was working it, for me. I think it would put me off for that. No, that was quite intense. <clears throat> well, this kid, this kid, straight away, he suspects there's something up with with the stuff, which obviously there wouldn't be a movie without there being something up with the stuff. And we then find out, and this gets, this kind of a bit Starship Trooperist now, because we get these adverts that pop up throughout the movie when they keep saying, um, what do they say? Enough is never enough of the stuff is never enough. And there's all these girls dancing and singing and eating the stuff. And yeah, this is like, it's like, it's better than ice cream. It's better than anything you could ever have. It's the stuff. What does his brother look like a werewolf? don't know. His brother looks like a werewolf, and his mum were, looks like Teddy Ruxpin. They were real-life brothers. Really? His, his, yeah. his brother literally looks like a werewolf, and I was so shocked by his mum looking like Teddy Ruxpin. Have you looked at them? I actually did. A, I sent you a picture, didn't I? You did. She looks like Teddy Ruxpin. He literally looks like Hi, it. Hi, I'm Teddy Ruxpin. Next time you watch this movie, please <laughs> get a picture of Teddy Ruxpin and look at his mum. It's fucking uncanny. So this kid, apart from his older brother being a werewolf and his mum being a bear who's you put tape recorders in the back of, <laughs> did you ever have a Teddy Ruxpin? No. Yeah, my friend had one. When I was about 10, my friend Martin had one. Could you record one. your own messages? Is that the thing you'd like press you, his you hand could put and record any something? Tape. No, oh, he, he would put... come with okay. story tapes. The little mini tapes, weren't they? Yeah. No, no, they were normal cassettes. <coughs> so you could um, put like Run DMC in it and Teddy well, Ruxpin would so... rap. This is what we did. So what we did was we he bought he got the Aerosmith. Uh, Walk this way. No, it was um one of their albums. I think it was called Pump or something like that. I don't know. And he put it in, and we were like listening to Loving and Elevator. But Teddy Ruxpin was sort of mouthing along to it, and we were like, "This is so pretty." So you, you get NWE or uh, NWE? Uh, you get Easy E or NWA? <laughs> uh, and get like Easy E rolling down the street yeah. in my six foe. Yeah, you could get all of that shit. Yeah? Fuck the police, going straight. Yeah, yeah Teddy Ruxpin doing that. Be amazing. Hi, I'm Teddy Ruxpin. Next time at our car boots, I'm doing that. Or I'll just get something really creepy and put it in people's rooms. So it just start saying something demonic. And I think, obviously, as his batteries wore down, he would be like, "Run, Teddy <laughs> exactly. Even better. I'm gonna eat your soul. I'm your friend. So we have really lost track of where we're at with this film already. And Larry Cohen would love that. I think he so. He would have loved that. I think so. The kid, the kid basically doesn't want the stuff, and his his whole family are really like trying to push it. They're like pushers later on, aren't they? But he, he's not into the stuff at all. His dad's like, "Come on, have that stuff." Nah, I don't want it. So we we cut to our main sort of antagonist now, protagonist, who is um, a guy, a businessman. He reminds me a lot of um, what's his name from Twin Peaks, Karl McLaughlin's character. Yeah, he, he, he's such a weird, interesting character. I was about to say weird, interesting. His real name is Michael Moriarty, but he plays David. He is the way he he doesn't come across as a handsome guy. This is, he comes across as he's very well cast as a very positive person. He's a person that knows what he's going to say, and he's got the gift of gab because he doesn't come across as a traditionally handsome person. Yet he could quite easily pull in this. Do you know what I mean? He has, but he literally doesn't give a shit about anything. He's got this role. He takes money from here, takes money from there. He's kind he, of he's, cool he's in very a good cool at, way. You know what I'm he's saying? He's very good at his job. He's an expert. And this is why he reminds me a bit of Karl McLaughlin, because he's, he's you know, he's got that look, but also he's very confident. He almost knows he's in a film, almost. You get that almost vibe, you know, that I can get away with pretty much anything because I'm such a cool fucking guy. And he and he does, pretty much. It's, it's you know, a really well-performed film, actually, the whole thing, you know. Um, he, he shows up on this yacht, he's been invited on this yacht, and it's full of these businessmen. And they basically want to know, these guys all run uh, huge um, corporations, and they want to know what the fuck are the ingredients of the stuff. Why does everyone love it? What is inside it? And they want this guy who used to be an FBI agent, he's an expert at sort of uh, consumer intelligence. They want him to go in and find out and get information and break down 
what the fuck is selling, what is in it, and why people love it. He's kind of like uh, the wolf in Pulp Fiction, of you know, totally different job roles, but the way he they are, do you know what I mean? They're trusted by different companies to go in and be the one-man operation and get this thing done. Yeah, totally. And he's even to the point where... It just stops a video of... shoot. Just stops, like a photo shoot. Just stops it. Just well, goes on, stop, 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 cut. I'm like, what the fuck? How can you just do that? You know. Just before he leaves the yacht, one of the guys oh, on there knows him. him. He yeah. just knocks him out. And he's so cool, he can just get away with it. He's like, yeah, fuck you. Yeah, and it's funny, though, because he doesn't look like the traditional person you'd have for this role. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't look like someone who's been punching people in there, pulling women here and there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's interesting. He also, he also reminds me of, and this parts of this film remind me of, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, with Tom Atkins, the way he goes the on that weird mission. Yeah, 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 it yeah. kind of reminds me of that as well, which is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. So we cut back to the family from earlier, and the, the son is really trying to explain to his family that, you know, we, we shouldn't eat this stuff. It could be spoiled. I think it's moving on its own. No one seems to believe him. And he loses his shit, and he throws a tub of it against the wall. His family are like, Junior's lost it. What is going on here? And he he progressively gets worse or loses it more as the film goes on and then ends up becoming a hero, which is brilliant. Mm. Um, it's pretty, pretty cool. So in a lab, uh, they, they're trying to figure out what is in the stuff. This reminded me of our World of the Strange where they, they tested that beef jerky to find out why it was so good. And then they found out it was made from humans. Do you remember that episode yeah. of World of the Strange? Uh, <laughs> how could I forget? <laughs> So they're trying to figure out what's in the stuff. They're trying to figure it all out. And yeah, we get um, more ads with models eating the stuff. And this is uh, this is where he just walks in. And he says, right, grab it, cut, 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 cut. Come on. And they're like, what are you doing? We're spending millions on this video shoot. Yeah, you just... Uh, uh... That just wouldn't happen. You, you're going to get the, <laughs> you're going to give the producer a fucking heart attack. His head, how uh, much they're going to scream at you. Uh, you know, it's just not going to happen. Imagine if this was the set of Terminator Salvation. What would um, Christian oh, Bell's... Oh, Bailey boy, McGee, McGee, what the hell? Oh, good for you. Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> and it's like. Uh... Like what are you making? Like the most incredible film ever? I I know I under, I I understand actually. The dude's like doing his job. He's in character, and it's his concentration is totally off. I completely understand, but at the same time, it's a bit like chill out. Yeah. Good for you. That video clip is hilarious, isn't it? It is quite funny, but you, you can kind of see where he's coming from. Uh, I guess I don't know. So this uh, this guy, our hero, um, David, he. Smash! He basically stops this video shoot and he grabs the PR girl, the marketing girl, and says, "Look, we need to talk. I need to find out some information." He's straight in this. Why he's such a good? He um, smooshes his way in there, then tells her. Basically, he's he's just like a con man or an abusive person. He tells someone what they want to hear. Yeah, he, that's what he does with everybody. That's why people give him money left, right, and centre. Uh, and he tells this woman that I want to put you in charge of a business. So she's like, oh, to cancel my plans tonight, I'm going to go and have dinner with this fella now. Um, oh, yeah. And I'll, I'll suck you off in the same time. Because she pretty much says that as well. Um, yeah. yeah, it's implied that she's uh, yeah. sexually uh, yeah, she's, attracted to him, definitely. Now, in a supermarket, there's a supermarket that seems to only really stock the stuff. And it is full everywhere. And this, the, the sun... He's lost it by now. He enters the supermarket yes. and he Smashes does what we've all wanted to do. He just goes along. He scoops all of the pots off the the cupboards. He smashes the fridges. People, No one stops him. A young sort of 12, 13-year-old boy completely demolishing the interior of a supermarket. No one seems to stop him. He manages to run away. And uh, and that's it. So we're, we're seeing, you know, these two are going to run into each other and get on their mission soon. But, yeah, we do... Uh, it's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. David v- visits somebody called Vickers now, doesn't he? Um, he is of the Food and Drug Administration. Yeah, and you, you know this character from a different couple of different films. Things. Yeah, he's definitely been in a few bits. I can't really, couldn't really place him, but he's one of those faces that you, you kind of reckon. Uh, and do, he says, do the right thing. He was in Leon. Uh, uh, yeah, do the right thing. Yeah. He says, uh, we tested and we approved the stuff. You know, it's it's all good. Um, don't worry about it. But he's got a dog um, and it eat, it's eating the stuff, isn't it, his dog? And 
Vickers seems a little bit afraid of his dog. Yeah. And uh, it's almost like the dog is the one in control in this house. It, it, it's it, it's weird because it doesn't uh, completely explain. I guess it leaves you as the audience member to figure, try and figure out what's going on, but it doesn't really clearly give you the right path to lead, I think. But yeah, you're right. It kind of implies that a little bit. And while our hero is is sort of snooping around his house, he finds his kitchen is just full of pots no, of the what stuff. He, what he does is he goes into someone's house, and I've never fucking done this. He goes into someone's house and says, oh, you're a nice dog. Do you want some food? Just goes wandering off into the kitchen with the dog to go <laughs> opens cupboards to get the dog some food. No, if someone came into my house and just all of a sudden I left them, I don't know who they are, just, oh, I'll be back a sec, stay here. I'll come back and they're in my kitchen going through cupboard, just giving the dog any old fucking thing. It's like, well, that's my dinner. Why have you given the dog my dinner? Like, who are you? So I was just a bit, I was just a bit taken back by that, as you can tell. But it, it works because he finds out that this guy is. It works for the, it works the, the plot of the movie. So yeah, it does. It is it the does. movies in it we're talking about. Anything can happen. Um, and uh, the the dog basically is is eating the stuff as well. And well, we'll find out a little bit more about that in a minute because he uh, also finds out that there's there's they start putting up these like a hot dog stand. It's like a fast stuff, food. Oh yeah, it's like yeah, a, the stuff one. It's like then, a stuff stand, isn't it? Yeah, then there's like a far, there's a drive-through one almost, isn't there? Is there like a drive-through one, or is this implying this is like a drive-through one? I think this is it's two thirty in the morning, and it's full of people who are desperate That's to it. get pots yeah. of the stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. They're queuing up all around all around the place, and the dog at this point starts. What I the phrase I've written down for this is stuffing out which people do a lot in this movie. They start stuffing out, which is where they sort of open their mouth wider than it probably should open, and the, the stuff itself starts sort of coming out of them, implying that this this stuff is kind of taking over your, your brain and, and guiding you, a bit like The Thing, I guess. There's a lot of stuff like The Thing in this, actually. Um, and the dog, that's why this guy's afraid of his dog, because the dog is kind of in control, because... I don't know why, because they're both eating the stuff, but it's pretty weird. I don't really know, but it's pretty good effects with the dog. Do you not think the, the dog's stuffing out there? No, it is. It is really good. Um, I've just made a mistake. I've just realised. I'm just checking out some pictures of uh, as we talk from the film. Uh, the mum, the Teddy Ruxpin looking mum's not in there. So Teddy Ruxpin looking mum's in the next movie. In the blob. Yes, yes. I do apologise. So don't <laughs> look okay. for Teddy Ruxpin in this. The mum in this does does look like Teddy Ruxpin. We'll talk about Teddy Ruxpin all over again when we do the <laughs> We can just go into it again. <laughs> Hi, I'm Teddy Ruxpin. Just discuss that whole thing all over again. Yes. Uh, the dog, uh, dog now goes and does actually attack Vickers. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Stuff's out. Stuff in everywhere. Knocks the stuffing out of him. Now, our hero goes to a gas station. And yeah. this is where he he meets a character who I'm a little uncomfortable with his name in this film, considering he's a, a black fellow. His name's Chocolate Chip Charlie. Yeah, but that's because he loves chocolate. I, I know, I know. It just feels a little bit... It, well, no. Um, we're we're hot, more heightened now, especially right currently, uh, to noticing such things like this. And I did think exactly the same thing. And it stayed like this for a while. I don't know then when it came out, you would have thought that directly. Because then it, he's like, they go to a bar and he says, "Can I have a chocolate chip cookie?" Because I'm chocolate chip Charlie, I'm, you know. So yeah, because he basically owns the company. It's it's not chocolate in any way, Charlie's. and I would actually say in no way whatsoever, Larry Cohen is racist because he he would be making films with every race whatsoever in like the streets of New York and stuff. I do you know what I'm saying? So um, <laughs> I I think you're looking at that in a 2020 mind. Yeah, no, I agree. And I know he's called that because he essentially ran a company called Chocolate Chip Charlie's who were famous for oh, okay. chocolate chip, you know, cookies. Because it turns out they're both on the same mission. They end up getting into a fight initially. They kind of team up as a really weird uh, a lethal weapon team up going on here. Well, they, they get into this scrap and then they realise Chocolate Chip Charlie says, look, my company got shut down because of this fucking The Stuff company. They basically bought out my company uh, and I'm ruined because of them. And he's like, well, actually, I'm looking for this, the guys behind The Stuff as well. And I need to know what the agreement is. So, yeah, they, they team up. They're on a weird mission together. Um, he said he was thrown out of his own company. Um, they figure out from speaking to the guy at the gas station that everyone in the town has moved to somewhere called Midland in Georgia. Yeah, because the, they've all just... The, the dude there, sorry, sorry, yeah, they've all just kind of moved out. The dude, dude there, he's just like, literally, like, he looks over and says, 
Ah, oh, there's another, another, another stranger in town. And it's just like li literally just because there's two different people in town that's two strangers. And it's like, oh, because there's literally no one in this place. It's a, it's a dessert. Do you reckon you could take make a porn version of a stuff called possibly like the stiff? Because I'm just looking at a still now a picture of just this woman with literally all you can see is one eye because the rest of it's this white gooey stuff all over her face. I'm just saying you can make a porn. I don't think you need to call it anything but the stuff, really. I guess. I'm just it thinking. just be called the stuff. The jizz. No, 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 the stuff. And you'd have to leave out any children out of this script. Oh, yeah. But the dogs could eat it. Well, no, you can't have dogs in it. Okay. Let's, let's keep talking. Okay, so <clears throat> they talk to the shop owner, uh, and he starts stuffing out his oh, mouth. Oh, I, I love this guy. His mouth opens <coughs> really wide. The post office uh, guy. He's just so yeah, sketchy, it's... though, isn't he? Because he sneaks out the back, doesn't he's he? He's really like, out, and they like, what the fuck's up with this dude? He's, ah, he's really sketchy. It's well sketchy, this character. And they, they see him stuffing out. It's very much like the thing, actually. Um... You know, a very disturbing, wide open mouth, it's... kind of. Yeah. So something's happening bad to them that you're not quite sure what it is, but it doesn't look good. No. It is very strange. Um, Chocolate Chip Charlie and our hero. What happens to them? They they get chased. They run outside. Be they run at the back. Be before they do, but when he's going to investigate very quickly, I like the fact that Charlie. Chopper Chick Charlie. I was calling Charlie. Charlie, uh, uh, the other mate says to him, do, do your thing. And Charlie does the, the worst kung fu slash karate <laughs> kick to the door. He just kind of just drops his foot and it plonks, plonks it open. You know, so that's... What is that? Charlie's possibly more confident than our hero uh, when it comes to what he thinks he can get away with and do because this karate kick, kick is terrible they don't actually know that this di guy's died from the stuff though by the way uh, because the stuff escapes out the window before they, they find him they find him dead so yeah, they it's did, still a bit of a, a it's st they, they, this, this is like um, with Vamp where they didn't actually like the main protagonist didn't actually know the, the Vamp they were vampires to like fucking two thirds of the movie you know they, they just don't know that it's the stuff at the moment it's just like some weird stuff's going on <laughs> hey excuse the word in there uh, some weird stuff is going on well they escape out the back and they they get chased um, and they get into a little bit of a scrap and then when they hit these people in this the is, face this, yeah, now this now this is your eye opener to the something weird's going on because they hit them in the face and their faces just kind of crack open like an egg and they kind of just fall to the ground and their their faces pretty much come off don't they and there's a stuff inside them yeah absolutely it's fucking weird and and this film is is quite jarring because like I said when we just got started talking about it right at the beginning it's quite, my only criticism of this film is the editing is a little bit um, jarring for me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel smooth, but I think that adds to it. Actually, I probably wouldn't want to change that because I quite like the fact that it's it feels a little bit disjointed, and it's good because you feel something uncomfortable is happening along this story. Something strange is happening. You kind of feel how our protagonists feel because it's nothing kind of flows well. It's, it's all quite, a bit like it. it, it just it just goes with uh, like Larry, Larry Cohen's kind of signature film, you know the way he makes his films uh, as well. Yeah, it's weird. It is weird. So they jump on a boat and they escape, and they end up going to a diner, and everybody in the diner is clearly on the stuff because, and this is what I'm saying. This could be a whole coke thing, you know, cocaine thing, because everybody in there is on this other level, and they're all staring at them, and it's a bit like they live again. They all. They're all on this other level and they're staring at our heroes and um, our heroes decide that they're going to split up. Um, and Charlie says, Charlie gets told, go to Washington, take this message to Washington and the FBI. You go that way and I'll go this way and we'll, we'll sort this out. And Charlie's like, yep, yep, no worries. I'll do that. That's all good. So they kind of cause a distraction and they, they end up um, splitting up there at that point. And everyone seems to be spying on our, our FBI guy. Um and he almost gets run over at one point. He manages... It's very... Again, it's just what the fuck is going on? Like, everyone seems to be after him. It's Twin Peaks. Yeah, or or the Cornish village in Hammer Horror Film. You know? Oh, yeah. It's got that vibe. Wicker mm. Man. Yeah, yeah, the whole uh, everyone's looking at you. Um, 
everybody's into it. You don't know who's involved, and there's a mystery going on. And and uh, the, yeah, the, and there's something killing people, which is the main crux of the badness of it. What's going on? So yeah, the mystery element's quite good. The investigation mystery element's kind of cool. All of a sudden, he shows up in this like chief marketing executive's mansion and gets paid twenty five grand for not going ahead, and they know he's not going to do the fucking job. And he's like, yeah, I'll take the money. And later on, he says, says, do you want my money back? And I'll spend it. He just says that, and they're like, oh, okay. He says, I want to know what makes this so addictive. What is what's in it? And the guy's like, don't worry about that. Here's 25 grand. Know. Yeah. Just take this. Just please go away. Yeah. We get more more adverts for the stuff, and they get funkier and funkier. Uh, it's parents... And they, some of them are very much like Coca-Cola adverts from the 80s, aren't they? Yeah, yeah it's your typical adverts. Um, his parents try to groom him into eating oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, the son. They no, are all... The sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are all, like, his brother, mum and dad are all, like, very clean cut. And now they're just swapped meal time to a huge bowl of stuff. And it's a case of, ah, oh, you know, you got to have your stuff. you got to be like us. And he's got to eat it, hasn't he? And he's made to go and eat it. Well, they... Yeah, because they're all sitting around watching TV and they're like... Come on, come on! Is it Brian? His name or something, isn't it? And they're like, uh, "Come on, eat it, eat this, eat this. It's delicious. Come on!" And he's like, "I don't really want to eat it." And they're like, "Come on!" And that's all they're eating all day long. I've lost loads of weight since eating this. I feel a hundred times better. I sleep better than ever. And it's like they're trying to promote that whatever it, this this thing is that they're eating is really good for them. Mm. It's like it's definitely like an alien substance. It's definitely not good for them at all. So he goes off to his room, and they're like, "We're going to lock you in your room until you decide you want to eat this." this stuff um they're acting like they're in a commercial in fact because they're sort of they hold it up and they go but this is a delicious substance you should really eat this because it will really help you with weight loss and your skin will feel instantly better from eating it it's, it's really interesting i wonder where larry cohen was at the time he came up with the idea and wrote the film um it's really interesting what he was taking from around him to you know take this and this like the clean cut american family you know, well, this is slap bang 1985. So this is slap bang in the middle of those 80s where everything was about yuppies, cocaine, Coca-Cola, um, commercials. Coca-Cola, yeah, all of that stuff. Pepsi, Coke Wars, and yeah, it was just yeah, like yeah. And they were, the, sell, they were obviously, sell, sell. they were obviously what like you... all those companies. I like, made the Coca-Cola, a very good example, and Pepsi, like sponsoring things like Michael Jackson and, just, and yeah. all that, the Madonna and all what you know, very big consumerism, huge at the time. This is what it is. Blah 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 blah. blah. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, and that's what one of the things that makes this film so interesting for me is this is probably more John Carpenter or George Romero, George Romero than they've even been because it's almost quite blatant. Yeah, uh, with the, with he might as well have just called this film Cola or Pepsi or something. No, you know? no I, I totally agree. Um, the kid, you know, kid... or Hagen Dars even because oh, it is absolutely. kind of yeah, stuff, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. The, the kid choice, the kids. Kind of clever now, but then he becomes stupid really with his cleverness. <clears throat> but he becomes stupid with it. <clears throat> he puts a uh, shaving foam, excuse me, shaving foam into his pot and uh, says that he's been eating the pot. And they're like, okay, cool. But he comes downstairs and keeps eating it until he's, until he's sick from shaving foam. Why didn't you just do it once and then just hold it and talk to them and then walk off and eat another bit? I've eaten shaving foam once and it's Why disgusting. have you eaten shaving foam? What situation were you in that you had to eat shaving foam? <laughs> because I, when I was very young, I went over to my my mum and dad's friends, and uh, I don't even know how it happened, but they were like, "Why did you?" And I think my dad or someone put some shaving foam on a paper plate and said, "Do a custard pie in his face." So I did it in my dad's friend's face, and then they did it back to me, and it all got in my mouth, and I ate it, thinking, "This is disgusting. It's like eating soap," which essentially is soap. Um, so that's how I know what the taste of shaving foam's like. It's disgusting. Well, there, also, there when you, go, you shave, listeners. get it in your mouth sometimes. Yeah, I don't wet shave, so. But there you go, listeners. <clears throat> Dan's eating shaving foam. By accident. I've eaten a lot of things by accident. I'm sure you have. When I, when I was younger, my mum used to have all these um, really uh, delicious smelling bubble baths and shampoos. Mm -hmm. and, and I went through a phase of going... Oh, that one smells like strawberries. I bet. It, I wonder what it tastes like. I put a bit in my mouth. Didn't taste very nice at all. And then I do that until I tried all the different shampoos and bubble baths. Yeah, and then, um, 
No, I wasn't sick. I was sick when I when I ate a Crayola crayon at school, though. Someone asked me if I would eat it, and I said, I'll only eat the orange one. So I ate the orange one. Yeah, it's got... because the orange one, obviously, is just better than the <laughs> blue one. And it, it got all over my teeth. I'd, I'd love reason... to have been with little Dan Bonet and his little logic head. Oh, I'll go the, for the orange the, one. The reason I got to find out is because wax doesn't really come off your teeth. Uh, so I had orange teeth that I couldn't get the wax off. And the teacher was like, why have you got orange teeth? And I was like, don't worry about it. She was like, hang on a minute, have you eaten the Crayola crayon? And I got told off and they had to bring my parents into school. I was about seven or eight. They had to bring my parents into school. So you, like me, are probably warnings to other children. Yeah. Because I was as well. So that's amazing. I used to eat plasticine as well. I was the warning not, not to put your head through the railings because you get your head stuck. I was that warning for some future pupils. Is that why your ears like it is? Fuck off. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I've got a little sticky out here. I can't help it. As a kid, I was called Yoda Lots. I know. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> Worst thing is now, in COVID world, when I put a mask on me, it pulls it more forward. So now I look like a fucking gremlin on one side of my head. Don't feed you after midnight. Don't feed me after midnight. Don't get you wet. Family chase him upstairs. <laughs> right, so yeah, he eats the shaving foam. Yeah. Uh, they, they find out that he's... He's pulling their leg. Yep. So he legs it, and they chase him out of the house, yeah, don't they? Yeah, out of the house, yeah. Yeah, they run out of the house, and he, he manages to leg it. Um, the, the, our protagonist gets, gets, grabs him, doesn't he? And just takes he him goes, with him. So, he just what? goes, hey, get in, I'll take you. Hey, kid, get in my car. I'll drive you somewhere. Now, didn't this kid ever get warned if a man pulls up in the middle of the night in your car and says, get in, I'll he, take you for a ride? Yeah, but he's don't probably warned by his parents who are actually chasing him now, so I don't know if the advice would have been I mean, actually key, you know. It's just, it's just even chain foam, do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> Literally, but, this kid doesn't know what, don't which way it. to go. Yeah, kid, yeah, I'll get in your car. Can we go to Never Never Land, you know? He gets sick in the back of the car, and he's like, you're right? And he's like, yeah, I ate shaving foam to get in with my crazy parents. So straight away... FBI guy's like, you're on my side. This is cool. Yeah, We're then, a team. Says, then says, oh, I'm going to go to get on an airplane. You're getting on an airplane with me. What? You're taking a kid on a private jet with you? What? what? Uh, the kid's just like, yeah, where are we going? Who, whose private jet is this? This is one bit I couldn't work out. Whose private jet do they get on? Uh... Is it the executive from the stuff? Yeah, I just get, I'm not sure. They just get on it. Like, fuck it, it doesn't matter. They get on a private jet and they, they take the kid with them. Cool. All right, you've kidnapped me. Put me on a jet. This is like what it must be like to hang out with Michael Jackson in the nineties, just getting chucked on a plane and flown all over the world, and off force you, fed you go. horrible things. You are. And I said, yeah, and off you go, flying around the place. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose you didn't defend Michael Jackson then, like you quite often try to do. I uh, no. I like to disclaimer when you say certain <laughs> things for audience members who believe in Michael Jackson's innocence or or, or that he not innocent that he just didn't do anything. So I'm just putting. I like to be our mutual benefactor disclosure agreement for the podcast. Yeah. The, the opening <laughs> lyrics to the song "Bad" are, "Your butt is mine, gonna serve you right." Yes, it could be. Your butt is mine. No, I reckon... Gonna serve you right. No, he's basically talking about diners that are making toast, and his butt is butter, and he's going to spread it well and serve it, <laughs> <laughs> it right. i tell you what, I was watching an escape video the other night, and there's this, there's this dude on it, and he had a cover of a Gary Glitter song oh, God. by a punk band on there, and I listened to the words of said Gary Glitter song, because um, it's a cover. I would never, you know... And I was literally fucking disgusted by it. Uh, if you listen to the lyrics, all of it literally is sit on my knee, little kid, and I'll sort of touch you up. And it's literally the whole lyrics are uh, basically a paedophile saying, do you want to touch me there? Do you want to touch me there? It's fucking disgusting. Please don't listen to it. You'd actually be disturbed. With your 2020 head now, you'd fucking be disturbed by that. Well, they fly, they fly to Georgia. Anyway. 
and they're heading to the manufacturing plant, which is where everybody seems to have gone, really, from that village that we were in earlier, that town. Now, while they're flying there, the pilot is killed by some of the stuff, and the stuff, which seems to have a mind of its own, whether or not it knows that these guys are on their way to try and stop it being created, it basically starts flooding the plane out. Um, Jason manages to escape. Uh, meanwhile, in the factory, um, our hero and Nicole, because he's teamed up with her now, the, the marketing lady, um, they're in there. They've been shown around, aren't they? They've been shown around the, the Coca-Cola plant almost. That's what it's like. Or Willy this Wonka's. is over here where we. This or, is where we bottle it over yeah, here. Or Willy Wonka's factory. Yeah. Daddy, I want a squirrel. Yeah. Daddy, I want a blueberry. The, the, this kid goes and hides in the fucking tanker. Well, that's a stupid idea. The blue, the, the blue screen's bad in this tanker, isn't it? Later on, when it, the stuff's coming towards him, it's fucking appalling. But, you know, to be fair, it's 85 and everybody would have been on a sort of a budget, so, you know, fair play. They do find some abandoned mines, um, and they realise that this this stuff's sort of in the mines, really. Um and then they're pumping it out the ground like oil, but it's stuff. And this is probably where that very first opening scene, where, where that security guard was, he where he found it and decided to gobble up the white, juicy substance that he found. It's pretty weird. Uh, oh, then they go to a... <laughs> this is the weird bit now. This is where it's like Larry Cohen doing whatever the fuck he wants. Because then we're in a hotel room, and our hero and Nicole are just having a little snooze together, just platonic. And suddenly the pillow just decides to attack him because the pillow's full of stuff as is the bed it's like it's like scary movie the parody of scream and when he, uh, the dude ejaculates <laughs> it is like that yeah. it's exactly the same as that and the the white just all over the, and the dude stuck to the wall yeah and a guy comes in to try and kill them, but he gets killed by the stuff. Now, this is the same room that they shot the Johnny Depp death scene in from Nightmare on Elm Street. Because yeah. it's a rotating room, so you could fire the substance all over the ceiling. And in this case, instead of blood, it was stuff. So the guy, it looks amazing like, as he sort of it floods over him and pushes him up onto the ceiling. It's a great effect for 85. You can kind of see a few flaws in it. But again, like you say, Gav, it's 85. It's all practical. It's, it's really good. Looks amazing. Um, gets the whole place gets set on fire, um, including <laughs> including our hero who gets some stuff on his face. So Nicole decides, so I'll just set his your face. face on fire. <laughs> He's going, help me, help me. She's like, all right, hang on a minute. <laughs> you almost sounded like Buster Rhymes again, then. Huh? <laughs> Come on, Michael. Okay. okay. All right. Wooha, okay. wooha, got you all in check. Whoa. Oh, I was literally okay. thinking about it earlier. I was thinking, they, they, they really should team up and do a rap album. Al Pacino and uh, Buster Rhymes. Buster Rhymes. Whoa, yeah. whoa. Got you all in check. Tell him, Buster. You got them all in check. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, burn yeah. his face. What? I've Did got an idea. To... I'm going to burn, the, burn your face. What? Yeah, it sets fire to him, sets fire to his face. But they manage to escape. The whole room catches fire. Then, then this dude attacks him. Who's he? He's just come in to get them. All right, okay. He's he's the, he's the one that gets sprayed all up the wall by the stuff. Oh, so okay. I think he's having to do with the company, and he knows that they're on the trail, so they, you know, they've got enemies now because they're getting too close to the, too close to the truth. Yep, you can't uh, handle the truth. I was going to say that as Jack Nicholson said, "You can't handle the truth." Okay. Oh no, that was that's Pacino. Not him. Michael, you can't handle the truth. There you go. <laughs> so they steal a truck, and it happens to be the truck. No, the kids. In he he hears he happens to be standing next to it when the kids goes no because they're pumping they're pumping the stuff in. They're pumping the stuff in. Uh, they're pumping the, the stuff, in, they? they're pumping the stuff into the tanker. <laughs> And the kid's in there, and he's just, oh. Um, uh, yeah, so he jumps in that particular tank and drives it in deeper into the caves. Yeah. Deeper into the hole. He drives it. It's a, after he's stopped pump them from the tanker, pumping stuff in, he drives, drives into the it hole. The hole, yeah. deep as he can. Deep as he can, proper deep. Yeah. And this is where they find a spring, like a stuff reservoir almost. Um, and they, they can see they're filling up. This is where they start filling it up. It's all... There's a lot of euphemisms in this, isn't there? Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah, he blows out the quarry um, with a bomb that he just happens to have. Where did this bomb come from that he had? 
Do you know? No. It's in his backpack. Did he have this the whole time? Was no, that no. his plan? Possibly. Does it, it doesn't matter. It's Larry Cohen. It's punk. Fuck it. It works. Yeah. It's almost like they said, for this next scene, we should probably just block the quarry. Larry, any ideas? Uh, he just pulls a bomb out of his backpack. All yeah. right. Put it in the script. Yeah. Boom. Next. <laughs> Nicole fights a guy. Um, and he gets run over and stuff starts pour, uh, pouring out of him uh, all over, and his face just explodes everywhere it's like they had a checklist of we can do this effect we can do this effect we can do this effect dude that's just probably how in. no that's probably how Larry Cohen did it because it, it, it's a case of right we've got this location we can do this we can do that okay cool well and then Larry Cohen would have written around what they could have had budget for absolutely they managed to get Jason out of the tanker just in time as the stuff is sort of reaching out for him. Um, and they realise that the police are actually all sort of what they call stuffies. They call them stuffies, don't they? Mm. Uh, and they realise they're all stuffies as well. So they, they sort of get pulled over. And he says, he says, your hose is hanging out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what what do they do to the policeman? Uh I can't remember what they do to the policeman, though. Oh, they pretend to eat the stuff, and they say, yeah, yeah, this is delicious. Mm, yeah, we're stuffies as well. And then they just knock the just cop Just knock out. this one copper out, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they head to a castle or a mansion now. <laughs> so this film That's just what is... I'm saying. That's why it's like World <laughs> War Z. It's just like all over the joint. But it's great. It feels like they've travelled well, from well, one end of America to the other. Well, there's an interesting line in the car, and they say, uh, she's like, where are we going to go now? We could go to that city? And he's like, we can't go to a small city. We stick out too much. We need to go to a bigger city, and then we blend in. And it's really interesting, you know, he's what they're doing and what he's saying. But, yeah, so they go to a castle where there's an army. And they... Which is they kind of... a bit like kind of 20 days 20 later. Days later. Oh. It is, this end of this is very much like that because mm. it changes for a moment when they arrive here and we get this army. Yeah, because they've got to... They first got Persuade. And luckily he's got the old smooth tongue, but they've got Persuade, the army, to help them out sort of thing. Yeah, they meet Colonel Spears. Who, um, why is he so angry and wants to help? What's his issue? <laughs> well, he's not just angry. He wants he's everyone to know angry. he's a famous hero because he's like, I'll do it. I'll, I'll save the world but, as long as you tell everybody that I was the guy that saved the world. Yeah. Well, okay. Can't you just save the world and that's enough? No, you want to be fucking famous off the back of it. All right, Colonel Spears, we'll do that. So, yeah, they charm him onto their side. Oh, he, they... uh, do you know the reason how he do it does it, though? He says because he tapped um, him once upon a time and he was with a 17-year-old girl. That's right. I tapped you and you were yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, okay, I 17. Okay, all right. It's quite, it's a bit young, really, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. It is. Um, it's a, I guess he's using that then to kind of just say, look, you're going to have to help me. But he does have a quite a lot of passion to help out with his army. He's very into stopping the cause. But yeah, like well, you say, he's trying to be a hero and get it, and get the the uh, the appraisal from the uh, the people again, really. Well, he they they charm him so much that they get him to agree to help them storm the factory, the main plant that they make the stuff in. And this now, my notes now say, for a moment, I feel like I'm watching an A-Team episode because this moment now where they storm in really reminds me of that. There's jeeps and trucks and no one seems to be dying. They're just sort of smashing and exploding things, but no one really dies. It's like an episode of the A-Team, really. Hmm. Um Stuff starts to pour down the stairs. Um, Jason and Nicole try to get away, and we get some more blue screen effects, which, for 85, this is brilliant, but it, it is a little ropey now. Um, the stuff explodes out of these giant vats, um, and the colonel says, um, I'm going to broadcast a public warning to the world. Uh, yeah. He says, I, I, I've got to do it, because it, then it, I'm the hero. How does he have the... Capability of doing this, then. Is he a good broadcaster? Has he got a good voice for radio? Well, what is this? A huge satellite dish, I guess, they're going through. I'm thinking about the technology and stuff as well. But It's a movie! Well, it gets even more Larry Cohen now, because there's this weird scene where he's on the where the colonel's on the phone, and he reveals that he was bullied mm. so badly yeah. that he now wants to be the hero. This confession just comes out of nowhere. Yeah, I was bullied so badly, and this is my chance to be the hero and, and get my own back on everyone that ever bullied me and show everyone that I'm the hero. 
all right, I don't know why this is in the film, but it's, I'm, it, I'm it, going with it. It's kind of weird. And they go to the studio to record the message. Then Charlie turns up again, and they're like, and, it, Hang and on, then stop, he... stop. this reminds me of They Live now. Okay. Because they're going to, you know, at the end of They Live, and they try and broadcast out from the studio. So he's definitely got some carpenter vibes in here as well. Uh, we do, so have carry a, on. do have a little bit of racism turn up because Charlie turns up and he wants to record again uh, in, with them and send out the message. And the the colonel was like, you're not coming in here, basically referring to his skin colour, uh, that he's not going to come and record. And they're like, hang on, this dude's got so many fucking thousands of listeners. You need him on. Oh, OK, come in. Let's not forget as well. Funny that you mentioned that the Colonel Spears has some naughty past with a younger lady because he's constantly trying it on with nicole who clearly is with our hero david and he's a disgraced when, colonel he has a backstory. at one point he says to him hang on dude she's uh she's with me and he's like yeah yeah we can change that <laughs> and so like, hang on jesus yeah. i'll knock you out yeah um i also love this bit where they rock up in town the army just hire like 20 yellow cabs and they just all ride into town in these cabs. And when they all get out of their cabs, the first thing that Colonel Spears says is, he says, pay the drivers, issue a 10% tip, and get a cash receipt. Perfect. Yeah, I guess. Didn't need to go well, into that detail, detail, but yeah, all right. Thanks for that. Yeah, Charlie shows up, like you say. Um, yeah, there is a little bit of weird racism around that. But um, when him and uh, Mo, as he calls himself, get reunited, they hug each other. You really feel that. It is like Riggs and Murtaugh, isn't it? They love seeing each other again. They're like, yeah, man. They've only met once. Yeah, I reckon there's probably some stuff on the cutting room floor, maybe. Yeah, but they hug each other and they they love seeing each other again. Um, Charlie says, look, man, I want to be involved in all of this as well. And, you know, I'll go online and I'll give my eyewitness accounts as well. I don't think I... there would be stuff on the cut room floor very quickly. I imagine uh, uh, Larry would have used every every piece of the cut room floor. All 87 minutes yeah, is yeah, yeah. here on yeah. the screen for us to yeah, see. Yeah, I imagine so, actually, yeah. Sorry. Well, Charlie, unfortunately, isn't Charlie, is he? Because he has been taken over by the staff. Yeah, uh, get this stuff. great scene where his mouth again. We're still going into thing territory, almost, aren't we? Uh, not as good as Boat Teen's. Uh, uh, his head explodes. Effect. Yeah, splat everywhere, and it starts attacking Jason, the kid, as well. Um, they manage to electrocute the stuff, um, and everything catches on fire again. Really bad blue screen here with the with the fire. Probably shouldn't point that out, but it is there when you watch a film like this from back in the day. Colonel manages to give his speech on the radio, though, and he says, burn it, destroy it, don't eat it. That's his message to the world. Burn it's a, it, destroy it, It's don't almost like eat it. not a living dead when they sort of give rules about what you do with the zombies at the end. Yep. Yeah. Burn it, eat it, don't destroy it. Remove the head. Um, and... We see a few weeks later on that there's we, over the next few weeks there's riots, there's fires. Yeah, all about of, this product. Well, it, it's funny enough. It comes, it pulls out of a news report. The, the screens we pull out, and it's a, a news report showing the screen that we we're just watching, thinking it's the movie is in her studio, and she's explaining what's going on. We get like this info dump now. So like we've jumped. It's such a weird point of the story we've had. And now we're jumping to like the after. It's like a couple of months in the future, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and thousands of people have died from the rioting and everything. Yeah. And she actually, and Nicole actually apologizes because she used to be like the head of marketing for the stuff. She apologizes to the nation for, yeah. for you know, and says, you know, well, we're really sorry that this has happened. Um, and I love this bit, man, where um, Mo, as he calls himself, and Jason visit um, the guy from earlier who lives in the mansion, the head of the stuff. And one of his boys is with him as well. So and they all get the taste. And he, well, they make him. They force feed them. Well, they've made another product now. Though. They're just like, yeah, it's good to go. Oh, he goes, yeah. that's all right. We've made the taste using the same product, which has changed the name. And that's that's another uh, uh, comment on companies, isn't it? Pepsi and yeah. Yeah, we, just, we, just, we just brand different. it differently and you will still fucking lap it up, basically. Yep. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Um, yeah, so Jason and him force feed them. Yeah. stuff at gunpoint they make them eat a pot of it and then they get addicted they say hang on a minute I've got a box full of it and then it cuts to an yeah. hour later and, they and they're fighting over cartons hundreds yeah. of cartons of and they're eating it and eating it and he says that brilliant line at the end where he says are you eating it 
or is it eating you? Indeed. And they've eaten tons and tons and tons of it. And then in the future, again, we cut a little bit further in the future and we find out that the stuff is still around, but it's more of an underground product, like a drug. You've got guys opening up their coats going, hey, man, you want some stuff? I got some stuff here for you. And it's become more of a drug in the future. And then we get an after credit scene. Yeah. Iron Man shows up and he says, look, I'm willing. Oh, no, sorry. That's a different after credit scene. I do apologize. Um, at the end, we just get enough is never enough of the stuff. Mm. I was almost going to go along with that. If you told me Iron Man turned up, I'd have been like, oh, yeah. OK, yeah, yeah, Iron Man. I, just, I don't remember that, but I'll just go along with him. Tony Stark shows up and starts eating the stuff. And that is the stuff. And it is that shit crazy. It's got so much charm, though. Um, it's got so much Larry Cohen and it doesn't really give a shit what you think. It just does what it wants, which I really, really respect it, And that's why I love this. It's like, it really is up there with Carpenter and Romero for, I'm just going to make this movie. There is going to be a plot through it, but I'm not really, I don't really give a shit how much, how many tangents I go on or what weird characters I throw in. Hmm. I'm interested, Gav, because I actually did not know this was your first watch. Um, I'm interested to know what you thought then overall. Um, yeah, I enjoyed the film. Um, I, like you don't I say, sound massively overwhelmed, but it was cool. It was alright. It's enjoyable to watch. It was a, it had a, like a mystery element. It was a nice eighties flick. Uh, I enjoyed like the whole consumerism thing going on. It's not the sort of film that I'm going to pick up to watch. Um, I felt it dragged a little bit at the end. Uh, I think it, was, it might it was, have been one. It might be one, perhaps, if you caught it earlier on. Yeah, you might. I'd you might have a little bit more. Might, yeah, but it, it, it's, all, it's all right. It's all right. I, you know, out of the two movies we we're watching, um, watching the Blob, I was just like, "Fuck me, this movie's fucking wicked." Um, so you know, this, this but the stuff is is enjoyable. I probably I'm not gonna rush to watch it again. What I'm saying. I'll give, it a, wants... I'll give it a thumbs up. If you're not seen it, I'll give it a thumbs up to watch it, but I'm not going to praise I, it. And I definitely give it a thumbs up. And I would also say, if, if anybody wants to see it who hasn't seen it, um, it is available on YouTube as I as we record this episode. I think it's so, on Amazon Prime as well, actually. There we go. So you've got options to watch it. And I think it's free on Prime as well. There's no rental there. And it's a quite a short movie. It's a very nostalgic, 80s, practical effects, a few, few blue screens. They were really pushing what they could do with effects. But also there is that whole Romero Carpenter message behind it of watch out, guys. Don't don't push the boundaries of, of, of things a little too much because we're all going to become addicts of a white substance. Ooh, what does it mean? Yeah, it was definitely looking at like a whole cocaine thing at that time as well, the early 80s and... Uh, and like you say, Coca Cola and that shit. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting movie. So it's it's yeah, it's worth a watch, you know. Um, and it's got some interesting. I think if it didn't have interesting characters, it wouldn't be as good. But the fact that our main character is so strange as a lead is, character, in, indeed, yeah. Um, but really yeah, I, 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 I'll give it a thumbs up. Definitely not going to give it a thumbs down. Um, cool, perfect. Time team, right? Yeah, well, we go from 1985 with the stuff too. We are about to hit 1998, Gav. We are almost upon the millennium. That's the millennium I, bug will be coming up soon. I remember that shit very well as well. Yeah. Will Smith did a rap song about it. But we will go to 1998. So hang on a minute. Let me just get this bloody thing started up. Hang on. Why am I <clears> in a like shell suit from the 80s? Is this now the outfit for the team tunnel? Yeah machine yeah look it's got 98 written on it see what so you're gonna give me a suit for each each year it's a bit wasteful i just replaced the patch that's better okay yeah all right mine still says 69 on it i don't know why well that's something else right ready mm -hmm. i am uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Here we go Whoa! what's this machine this is my time machine yeah. your time machine yeah for the next five minutes, we are going to be the Time Team. The Time Team! Whoa! Whoa. What's this? Look at that! Look at that! Well, he's been dead a hundred years! Look at that! Look at that! That's the Statue of Liberty coming out of the sand! Oh, there's a dinosaur! Oh my god, look at that! It's something else! <laughs> hey! It's always a bumpy are. ride. 
It is. It's never smooth. I wish you get now, the springs done in this chair. It's a strange main bit which keeps bouncing up in the middle. Watch out for that bit of stuff on the what ground, that, that bit of white stuff. It's stuff, isn't it? Mm. Okay, we're here in 1998, Gav. Soak it in. Look around you. Yeah, Only a couple what, of years left of I, the 90s. I remember this uh, this sort of era, you know. So, so yeah. Skateboarding at the time now, really full on for me. I actually uh, had a few tricks under my belt, really sort of, you know, hitting it a bit harder. Prime time. Well, let's start off with a bit of nostalgia, and I'll talk about toys initially, and this will take you back to 98 quite nicely. So this is what people were really into toys-wise. So some of the best-selling toys were Pokemon, Pokemon were a big thing in 1998. Yeah. Uh, Rugrats toys, because the cartoon was still doing really well. I was called Chucky by one of Chucky. the... Chucky. Uh, which is funny, because that's like the nickname nowadays, but yeah. And this is also the year that toys became a bit of a, a, a you know, a sought-after thing, because for Christmas, all the kids wanted was Tamagotchis. Oh, yeah. Um, and if they didn't want Tamagotchis, do you remember the bloody Furbies that everybody had, the little... Yeah, Little I was literally thing. the other day took one out of Daisy's cupboard. She put it in there, it creeped her out, and it was in the dark. So I just pulled out the cupboard, and Elijah found it. I don't know where it is now, but he was he had it in the on the hallway, and I could just hear it going. Hello. Yeah. So we've got a couple dotted around the house that occasionally go off. What the fuck is that? And also, um, Teletubbies. The toys were huge. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's the kind of a little bit of nostalgia there for toys. So let's talk about what was going on in the world. So Google mm. was found, founded as a company, a search engine. Yeah. So people started saying, I'll Google it. Now it's just a thing, isn't it? Google it. Just Google it. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's just a standard search engine sort of thing you go for, yeah. Yeah. Hong Kong opened the world's biggest airport this year. Mm -hmm. I've been there, in fact. I've been there. It's a huge, absolutely gigantic airport, and that opened in 98. Um, we also had a bit of sport. Uh, it was France 98 World Cup. France won it by beating Brazil in the final. Okay. So that was another little bit that happened as well. Um, Bill Clinton was in the news in 1998 because he did not have sexual relations he got a blurry off Monica he left some stuff on her dress didn't he what is that with these presidents hey what's going on well I don't know he just liked a little bit of a who was she <laughs> was she his secretary uh, she was something like that wasn't she so he's in there with her and it's a bit like she was his secretary secretary <laughs> she goes sucks him off then she's well, did she spill the beans? <laughs> she spilled the stuff. Did she spill the beans though? Did, how did it come out? I don't know. I don't. I think it Gently. went all over her dress, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I did not have relations with. Yeah, I love that. that. I love that message. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. She well, just put what you said is she didn't have sex cock. with her, but you just shot your load all over her dress. That's even worse, isn't it? That's a bit of a Weinstein flower spreader. Flower pot spreader. Uh, might have been an accident. How was that accident? You'd At what point do you ever have an accident? You've jizzed outside of your trousers somehow, like it's teleported. All, all over your secretary's imagine, dress. Imagine you can teleport your jizz in different places. Oh, dear. Well, look, talking of this, let's transition into Free Willy. How do we do it? How do we do it so well? Free Willy, the real whale... Yeah. was released back into the wild this year as well. Was Free Willy actually a real whale? I thought it was just a yeah. movie. Well, no, it's a real whale. I didn't but know they that. they did CGI in a whale. No, 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 I don't mean that. Oh, you're saying the movie, Free Willy, the whale that played Willy, yeah. was obviously a, a real whale. Yeah. Not real Willy, real whale. Yeah. And... Yeah. Okay, cool. His I name thought... was Cal... His name was Calco. I thought you'd tell me but... it's a true life story about a whale called... Willie. No. No. All right. So they released him back into the wild in Iceland. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay. not really news, though, is it? Well, it's quite... I thought it was quite good. Go on. <laughs> um, digital television launched in the United Kingdom. So this is the year we started to get quite a few ah. extra channels coming in now. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we started... Uh, me and Dan would have remembered three. Then we had four. Hey! <laughs> 
and then five. Then and we had now five and five for shit. Got about thirty channels. And by now, now we have thirty channels of shit. <laughs> also, Gab, Windows ninety eight. All right, that's yeah. I love the names for them. What year is it? Nineteen ninety eight. Call it Windows ninety eight. Yeah. Brilliant, love it. Um, you'll like the next one. The iMac was unveiled. I'm I'm staring at one at the moment. Yeah. The iMac. There we go. Very important year, talking to Free Willy and Bill Clinton, because this year, a little blue pill became available on the market that helped men. Viagra? Viagra. Uh, One of my friend's fathers uh, was one of the uh, uh, founding members of the uh, drug. And he has lots of money, as you can imagine. I took one once. It got stuck in my throat and I got a really stiff neck. Have you ever had one? No, I haven't, but I've I was got around, a funny story about it. I've, got, on, I've you, got a story, tell too. Tell me your story. All right, I was around someone's house while I was doing a bit of work. They're like, oh, all right, uh, do you want to buy some Viagra? I was like, what? Do you want to buy some Viagra? Like, and he had this box full of Viagra, and he was basically a Viagra dealer, and I was like, I don't want any. He still made me take some Viagra for free. I think he's trying to get me hooked on it. So, like, look, lit- literally, literally, the wind can blow, and I'm hard. I don't need... Viagra. There's a, an image for our listeners there. I don't need supplements. Okay, I'm I'm absolutely fine. Uh, it must be a horrible thing if you're not. I remember that episode of the Osbournes and Ozzy took it. Sharon, Sharon, I can't fucking get it down, Sharon. It's so. Oh it's I was <clears throat> fuck up all night. I was Sharon asleep. I was laying there with a fucking bone all night. Hilarious. What's your story about Viagra? Then? So similar to that, actually, when I was about, uh, I was quite early in, I was probably about 20, 21, and I had a driving instructor, and he was very much like this Sid James. This sounds bad. He was very much like Sid James. He used to make me drive around the field called the Downs He used to Bristol. make you drive around. Yeah. And he'd go, hang on, slow down a minute, she looks all right. And if a jogger was jogging uh, past, he'd no. make me slow down in My the car. instructor used to do the same. It was horrible, a, isn't it? it? Yeah, yeah. Well, he had loads of tattoos on his arms because he was in the Navy. He was a very old bloke who'd been in the Navy. So he's a real. he had a real sort of sailor's... My dad, uh, basically, yes. He's like your dad, basically. It, my dad's in the Navy and he's got tattoos and he's not like Sid James. So, so yeah. basically, my dad's your driving instructor without the paedophilic one, parts. One day, he said to me, what are you doing for the rest of your day then, Dan? Because I used to do my Saturday... My, um, driving st- lessons early on a Saturday morning and I'd often leave my girlfriend in my bed at the time and she, I'd get home and, you know, my... I'd you don't my need parents. to go into the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> we know. We know what happens. But anyway, he said, uh, he said, oh yeah, you're seeing your girlfriend. You know what? Oh, I've got some Viagra if you want. And he pulled some uh, tablets out of his pocket in a little tin and he went, I'd say, oh, I'd sell these to you. You can have a four or five of them. Maybe we'll call them a tenner for three or four of them or something. And uh, you can have these. You and your girlfriend can have a wonderful weekend. She could take them too if she likes. It's good for the woman as well. And I said, no, you're all right, thanks. I was about 19 at the time. I literally couldn't get it down, let yeah, alone up. Yeah, absolutely. Like, why are you trying to sell me a Viagra? I don't. I do not need it. Yeah, and this dude kept kept trying to do it to me the whole time. So he was like, "No, I don't need Viagra. I don't need them." And I had them. I kept them, and then threw them out once. Never, what ne- is it? What is it with people trying to sell us Viagra? Do we look like we have problems with our erections? I think we do. Erectile <laughs> dysfunction. <laughs> Should we be a candidate for adverts for erectile dysfunction? Welcome to the podcast on Flaccid Hill. Um, <laughs> Sponsored by Viagra. <laughs> well, let's talk about what was on television. Hi, I'm Gav and I'm Dan. We have problems with our willies. So, on television, popular shows were Fraser. Yeah. Friends. I'll be there for you. The, the X-Files. Do, 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 do. Oh, are you going to do this for All right, there's the next one. ER. Go on, do that one then. Boom boom. <laughs> Buffy the Vampire That's Slayer. Oh, I don't know. I don't know any of these now. Alright, Teletubbies. Teletubbies. <laughs> Stop. Teletubbies. Uh, and, and even One Foot in the Grave was still going in 1998. And also, I love One Foot in the Grave. 
Also, a TV show which I fucking love. Not many people talk about. Everybody loves Raymond. So. I I fucking uh, when I mean, when you've talked about this before. When we Jay this was show. well, when was Jay was young, and I'd have to be up in the morning with a baby, and I was very new to doing all that sort of shit because I stayed at home. I stayed up with my first two kids as their babies through the day. I'd like look after them. I'd have a coffee and I'd sit there and every morning everybody oh, loves hi, Raymond. I'm Raymond. Oh, <laughs> uh, Raymond. Oh, yeah, Raymond. Oh, yeah. I'm Raymond. I'm your brother. I'm, I'm Raymond's big brother. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was odd. But also, uh, we had King of the Hill, South Park. The, so we were really... The 90s, 98 was definitely a, an interesting time for telly. Mm. There was a lot going on. Yeah. Um, Moving on to films before we do horror and, of course, music and hip hop. So, films, just to give you a taste, we had Armageddon. I've never seen it. Titanic. I've never seen it. Saving Private Ryan. I've never seen it. A Bug's Life. Have seen it. Lethal Weapon 4. Absolutely. The Wedding Singer. Yes. There's something about Mary. There was some jizz in her hair. That was like the stuff, wasn't I it? I watched there something about Mary again, not that long ago. The only funny thing is, Frank and Beans, that's, and he gets his testicles stuck in a zip. The rest of the movie, yeah. he's not actually that funny. It's it, not that funny, it was, I agree. I was kind of gutted when I watched it back. There was a film that came out this year, though, Gav, that we both love. Godzilla. Fuck it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I'm going deeper underground. Do, 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 do. Oh, I like, great, I don't like Jamaica. It's all right. Yeah, yeah. I love Jamaica quite too. All right, so you haven't seen a lot of the films that came out in uh, 1998. Same Private Ryan, I reckon I might have done. I'm pretty sure I've seen Shaving Private uh, Ryan. Shaving Ryan's Privates? Or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't Schindler's, think I have. Schindler's I... Fist? Have you seen Schindler's Fist? No, not seen Schindler's Fist. That's That's quite a bad name i know you shouldn't do that you shouldn't make a porno based on a holocaust movie i've said this before but there's a make of lifts in uh, london uh, and they're made by schindler so it's actually schindler's yeah. lifts well i've seen that when i get in the uh, in yeah. there's a couple of lifts i've been in with schindler yeah anyway schindler's lift um musicians that were popular now this is 1998 I was, All Saints. I was working at a restaurant with the radio on constantly listening to the same shit over and over you would have been listening to the All Saints. Did, did the Avalanches release their a track here? Psy, uh, psychosomatic. Oh no, no, I'm thinking of Prodigy here. Yeah. Go, carry mm. on. Sure. sure. Spice Girls, Alanis Morissette, Janet Jackson, Chumba Wumba. Oh yeah, they got popular with that track. I, I, uh, I, these are all guys that I were popular this. in the charts at the time. Yeah, um, yeah. English now, charts you're on the pool we're talking about. Well, no, I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about the world. Okay. Because it's an Indian Madonna, all I, of these I guys were sick. specifically remember this time in a restaurant and hearing all these songs over and over. And I, I was working with a girl who was quite a fan of Chumba Wumba when this song <laughs> came out, and she used to get angry because she was an original fan, and this was a pop sellout. Thing. I get knocked down. It's an and awful I get song. Up again. It is a terrible it's song. Fucking terrible. Yeah. All right, well, hang on. Let me just press the hip-hop button. It's going to be awful. Fresh. No. <laughs> what came out this year? Well, we did have a good album from Mo Def and Talib Kweli called Black Star. Do you know that album? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's right. Really, really good album. Yeah. I'll skip over Jay-Z. He had yet another album out this year. He released an album every year in the 90s, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, probably did Tupac as well, but yeah, go on. <laughs> Tupac and Biggie, they kept releasing even after they died. Yeah. Um, we also had another Tribe Called Quest album called The Love Mo Movement, which wasn't very good, but I it was a work. I sold that on vinyl uh, within the last six months for about 25 quid. One Hit Wonder, because he only released one album, then he died of a heart attack. Big Pun um, dropped his album, Capital Punishment. Uh, I didn't really like Big Pun, but I'm a big fan of his son, uh, Chris Rivers. He's an amazing rapper. And one of the best albums. Why was he called year. The Son of Pun? Don't know. Punson. 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 Hanson. 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 One of my favourite albums that came out this Hanson year was. Hanson little those little kids. Those little blonde fuckers. Three of them. Okay, fucking hell. Yep. Can't believe so I one of my favourite albums that came out this year was The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Oh, yeah, yeah. Food. food really dude. good album. Yeah. Um, really good album from Lauren Hill. And she only ever made the one album. <clears throat> um, a rapper that came out, really, really came into his own this year was a guy that was like, hey, everybody listen. Oh, my God. Where are my dogs at? My name is DMX. Oh, Every yeah. time I talk, 
I've got to sound like that. Him and Al Pacino would work well together, actually, I've just read up. <laughs> uh, the hip hop at this point, I wasn't really. At this point, I wasn't checking out anything new. I was like, you know, still rocking my old stuff. My name's Al Pacino, and I'm working with DMX. DMX, oh my god. You can say this could be a, a, a mass amount of albums with Al Pacino's works with everybody. I'll tell you an album that came out this year that was awesome, which I was a big fan of, was the Beastie Boys' Hello Nasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I picked that up on final uh, a couple years ago for a wedding. I was playing that. They, they asked. Le- legitimately, one of my favourite Beastie Boys songs ever is on that, and that's um, Intergalactic. Absolutely love yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Big master mic at this point. That's cool. It's fantastic. Um, I'm going to stop there, because... Uh, yeah, yeah, so I don't need any more. There's, there's but, Ice Cube but. dropped um, one album called... War and Peace, but that, that's what I'm gonna, that is, what I'm gonna say. I'm not even gonna talk about it. That is that. Hit, uh, horror, horror, not hippity hippity hop, but horror, horror. What was going on in the horror, horror world? Well, again, the correlation, so we know where we're going with this. It's getting better. It's getting better. We had the faculty. Great. Great movie. We've covered l- it. This is Robert Rodriguez becoming mainstream, being able to do Desperado. Um, essentially a remake of El Mariachi and being in the studio system but still being that little little rebel he is but doing it's this really film, film and I'm really happy he did this it's kind of underrated you don't look at this as a Robert Rodriguez because it's not it it's not really stands out with his fingerprints. It's a studio film. It's very but Hollywood. Well movies, directed. Yeah. That's it. And um <laughs> it's probably the only film of his like that as such. Even Desperado had a Robert Rodriguez tip to it, but Faculty doesn't. But it's still, we've covered it. Still a good movie. This um, next few movies are all a real taste of where we were at in 98 with horror. So obviously The Faculty. Halloween H20, which you and I are quite big fans of. Uh, yeah, I, I don't mind that film. Yeah, great movie. Um, the Bride of Chucky. It's fun. It's a fun movie. I've seen it uh, once. I need to watch it again, but yes. It's a decent movie. Urban Legend. Yep. It's a bit of a guilty pleasure for me. Yeah. Um, I do like it. Ring came out. The original Japanese Ring came out this year, which is a classic. The Sarah Michelle. <clears throat> no, no, the original, the Japanese. Oh, sorry. Um, John Carpenter was that back this year. Vampires. Uh, okay. Great opening and then just falls a bit flat. Not, not a big fan of that one. Mm. I still know what you did last summer. Sweet. We love it. We love that guilty pleasure. It's all right. Phantasm dropped another. Are you <laughs> saying? Are you saying both our guilty pleasures are from this year? Halloween H twenty. Oh and... no! When's Godzilla? Oh Godzilla! Yeah, yeah. and I still don't get yeah. last summer. Isn't that funny? It is funny. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we had quite a few sequels. So prepare yourself because I will be covering a few sequels in a moment. We had Phantasm Four, Oblivion. We did Phantasm films, didn't we? We, we did the entire series, yeah. Mm. Children of the Corn 5020. Five, five, Fields of Terror. Fields of Came Dreams out. with Kevin Costner. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. Blade came out this year. Brilliant opening. What a fucking badass. Uh, what a fucking badass. I, I love the opening. It had DJ Crush playing. It's like, but nobody knows who DJ Crush is. Yeah. yeah. Was that I love DJ Crush. Yeah, in, in the soundtrack. But that beginning so good. We've covered Blade. We have. Um, Puppet Master 25 came out this year. Fucking hell. <laughs> Fuck that. Moving on. Now, do you remember last time we were in the Time Machine, I talked about a sequel to um, a movie Stephen King movie. So the original was called Sometimes They Come Back. The sequel was Sometimes They Come Back Again. Well, this year we got Sometimes They Come Back For More. Okay. It's not that It's not that bad. I was about to diss it hard, but it wasn't that bad. Well, I'll tell you what was bad. The Psycho remake starring Vince Vaughn that came out this year. A bit wanking. With him wanking. Didn't need it. I did not need it wanking. Didn't need the movie, to be honest with you, but... What are we going to do? I'm going to remake a Hitchcock classic. <clears throat> the only thing I'm going to change is... It's a wanking scene. A wanking scene. <laughs> what if, why would you do that? Vince Vaughn's like, yeah, I'm really excited to be in this remake of this classic. We're going to really do it justice. So there is one thing, Vince. What's that? You need to wank. I've only seen the movie once. Is he wanking while she's having a shower? Is that yeah, he's, up, yeah. he's having a little... So it's good he ain't got made a little fucking glory hole in it. 
He's, he's having a peek through, like having a little wink wink. A wink wink? <laughs> oh. Uh, species 2. Yeah. You met this year? Not, not much to say really on that. The X Files movie came out this year, the first one. They started to scrape the barrel a little bit, weren't they? They were like, what can we do to get money? David Duchovny, Gillian Anderson. All right, we'll do a movie. Yeah. I don't really remember thinking it was that good. No. We've talked about Godzilla. Yeah. His class as a horror. Yeah. Um, Dark City came out this year, which yeah, yeah, is not, not yeah. often talked about film, and it's quite a, a good one. And another one that I really like is Sphere. With, uh, uh, I saw it in the cinema. L. Jackson, Sharon Stone. Oh, no. Got it out from video shop. One or two, but yes. That's a good one, that one. Wasn't too bad. Wasn't too bad. Wasn't too bad. And the last one I'm going to mention is a movie called Dead Man's Curve with Matthew Lillard, uh, where they figure out if your roommate commits suicide when you're at university, mm. you get to just pass all of your exams. And it's called The Dead Man's Curve. It's to help with your mental health. I so, of course... I've never heard of this film. Oh, it's brilliant. It's really good. It's kind of your really? screen sort of... Yeah, it's really good. Like, who done it? serial killer type movie shit I'll have to check it out so that is 1998 now the takes from that really are going to be and there's quite a few of them on this one if we're bundling these up these VHS's up we're taking with us the faculty mm. uh, we're going to we're going to take probably I still know what we did last summer I'd say grab Bride of Chucky and Halloween H20 you've got to put Blade in there as well um, and of course Gav you and I would want to have Godzilla on Laserdisc absolutely I'll tell Here's you what something. Uh, it was 1999. I was in um, I was in San Francisco. Some buddies came out. Uh, we hired a car. And we drove to somewhere. Went to desert. Went somewhere else. And then we went up to the mountains, kind of. Well, not mountains. It's a lot higher up. Um, and we stayed at this hotel. Higher than thing. the mountains. Oh, no, I just, I don't know where it was. It was it was higher up. It's all you had to close. Space. Shut the fuck up. And we're staying in this hotel, and the dude I was with his girlfriend, he wanted a bit of alone time. You know what was going on there. Mm. Apart from the fact, actually, something happened where me and my buddy both decided just to get naked and get in the hot tub, and his girlfriend came and joined us, and he, he, that obviously didn't go down too well. And we were literally just like drunk, going, fuck it, you know. Anyway, that's another story. We Hang were, on a minute, I want, can we do this? Sorry, but... Yeah, but me and Buddy was just like, if I could get naked, then she came going and she got topless. And, it, and then it, he was just like, what the fuck? And I was like, we'll come in as well. So he came in and he got naked as well. And we're just hanging out in the hot tub naked. We're just buddies. We're still buddies now, was, you know. Um, then I did stay naked, though. And I sat and watched telly. <laughs> I sat on the sofa and just watched TV. I stayed naked. I just didn't bother getting dressed. I thought, fuck it. And then she came and sat next to me while he was on, like, sitting. His uh, boyfriend was on the bed kind of watching... Uh, the TV watch TV and she came and said naked it's a bit weird it's obviously because like naked this is not the story I was telling <laughs> so me and my buddy my buddy got naked and that. I'm not going to give any names out we went wandering around the hotel late at night and we found a naked. TV and we opened up this cabinet underneath full up of fucking videos and there's this movie called The Faculty and didn't know what the fuck it was and just put it on uh, and we could just watch whatever you want and put it on it's like this is fucking amazing that's my first thing but anything the listeners got away from that is the fact that I was just naked all the time Somewhere once. So in 1999, Gav I was, was somewhere naked in California. In San no, it wasn't San Francisco. Somewhere in California, I was naked. In somewhere a... higher than the mountains, <laughs> naked. <laughs> I was possibly higher, higher than, than the mountains. The mountains. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a naked hot tub story. Have we you? probably don't have time, so we probably should just jump back in the, we do, the time we, machine. We d probably need to keep going. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's do your naked story another time, yeah? Oh, okay. Can you say it quickly? <laughs> yeah. Go on and go. About, about three years ago. Oh, okay. Mine was 1999, yours was three years ago. Right. Went, went away to an Airbnb. There's about eight of us. Yeah. And uh, we had a hot tub there. And the first night, everybody jumped in. It was great. The second night, everyone was a bit hungover. And I was like, well, I'm going to use the hot tub again. So I went down there on my own. I took a couple of really big Cuban cigars with me. I took about six or seven beers, lined them all up on the side, and I jumped in there. I took my little Bluetooth speaker. I put on a load of 90s hip-hop, and I spent about four hours in this hot tub on my own just listening to hip-hop, smoking cigars, I've done drinking booze. Yeah, I've done and the same. 
I in my head I was in like a two part video or something, you know. And and then and then I realised after about an hour I realised no one else is coming down here. Yeah. And I had a really good view of the Airbnb from where I was from the, so I could see anyone coming. So I thought I'm gonna get naked. So I just took my shorts off and I was just bubbling around in there for about four hours smoking cigars. Yeah. And at one point, one of my friends decided she'd come and check on me. So I saw the door open and it took about three or four minutes to get. So I quickly grabbed my shorts and popped them back on. And then she got, she was like, I'm just checking you haven't drank. I was like, no, no, I'm good. I'm having a good time. Just listen to my music, having a drink. Yeah. And then uh, as soon as she went back inside, Ripped them off, off they came. <laughs> I thought you say you all got naked in the uh, hot tub. No, no, no. But you know, it's it's cool. I've got I'd I'd be I'd get naked view in a hot tub. I'm sure you would, and I'd love that. So let's do it. There you go. Well, talking of hot tubs and naked, it's time to get back in the hot tub time machine, or just the time machine, and we're back to 2020, where it's all a bit shit. But we are going to talk about the blob, which is fucking brilliant. So That's fucking well good. Let's watch it. Uh, let's watch it. it? Uh, let's talk about it. Get in there. Get in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Let me press this. Oh, not that, this. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Fucking hell. Bye. If it had a mind, you could reason with it. If it had a body, you could shoot it. If it had a heart, you could kill it. Now, man is no longer the supreme being on this planet. The organism is growing at a geometric rate. By all accounts, it's at least a thousand times its original mass. Nobody believes me about what happened tonight. What did happen? You were there, you saw. Plasmic life form that hunts its prey. Predator. I want that organism alive. I think you ticked it off. The blob. Terror has no shape. The blob from 1988. A deadly entity from space crashes near a small town and starts to consume anyone in its path. Panic ensues as shady government scientists try to contain the horrific creature. I don't think hardly class it as a, a specific creature, but that is a synopsis. This film is fucking it's, cool. It's directed by Chuck Russell. Uh, Chuck Russell directed The Mask with Jim Carrey. Well, well, he went basically the first movie he sort of goes and does. Uh, is it Nightmare on Elm Street three? Nightmare on Elm Street three, The Dream Warriors. Then, then a year later, The Blob. And then just doesn't do anything for like six years, um, and goes and does The Mask. And then after that, he decided to team up with Arnold. Arnold. He, made, he directed Razor. But four years later. Did that a razor? What oh, no, a strange years later, so. career! Yeah, very strange. Really weird. Yeah, very strange. But what can I say about this film? Obviously, we both love it. Uh, no, we're going to spoil that immediately and say that we both absolutely fucking love this film. Now, I'm very quickly going to jump in and say this to me is quickly. I've realised this is probably one of the best remakes alongside The Thing and The Fly for me. Um, um yeah. It's, and they're all 80s remakes of 50s movies. And, and they're made really well. Um, do, if you're on IMDb, do go to the photos and click number five. You can see a very clear image of the mum, so you can think of the Teddy Ruxpin nurse in her. You see that? Hang on, just get in there. She, she looks like a concerned Teddy Ruxpin, though. It's like Teddy Ruxpin's just caught you having a wank. I can't see her. Oh, it's a shame for you. But, but... <laughs> that's a shame for you. <laughs> I'm winning. You're losing. 
The Blob, though, Daniel. This is, like we said, a remake from a Steve McQueen film from the uh, 50s, like you said. This is... Well, uh, I watched it once. Um, obviously didn't take it on board or was in the wrong place or was chatting away to people or whatever because this film's amazing. Kevin Dillon's hair. Wow. That, that's <laughs> something. Um, we've basically got acid acid dude from the fucking Robocop as a sheriff the same death he melts again he gets in there. the same death but Kevin Dillon's hair that is, that is just something yeah and uh, who else have we got we got Shawnee Smith in this who is a bit of a, a crush from the late 80s Bill, uh, Bill, Bill, Mo- Bill Mosley yeah I didn't spot him he's in it as a oh, soldier yeah, I spot him. he's at the end you know when they're in the cellar just with one soldier and they get trapped in that's him is it yeah he, he's he got actually, like a suit. yeah, yeah, he actually, he's acting. Just it, all he's doing is that scene, and the acting is really fucking good. Actually, he looks proper freaked out, and it's like literally like that's a really fucking good performance. He's not overacting in any way. That's very realistic. I, I was quite impressed. Kevin Dillon obviously his is hair. the brother of Matt Dillon, and he looks exactly like him. Like it's uncanny. It's just like Matt Dillon in a weird wig. It, it's it's kind of yeah. It's kind of yeah, sort of lower Matt Dillon, isn't it? Really, um, it's it's basically what we want in a B movie, Matt Dillon. Sorry, we forgot to mention one of Chuck Russell's later films he directed, Scorpion King, yeah, with Wayne The Rock Johnson. It's terrible. It's terrible. Kevin Dillon's hair jumps a bridge. I'm not talking about it. <laughs> yeah, no. it about five times. But his hair jumps a bridge, doesn't it, on a motorbike? He he does jump for that. He's got an incredible mullet. He's got an incredible mullet. Um, we know we're in for a treat with this film because we get the TriStar logo. And whenever you get the TriStar, that's like getting the Canon logo come up. You think, here we go. This yeah. is going to be a good one. Yeah. And this, what sells this film all the way through is the practical effects and a series of disgusting practical deaths, which they must have really pushed the boundaries of what they could achieve with, you know, it's up there with the thing and the fly. I said it just now and I'll say it again. Those, those, these three films all have such incredible standout, disgusting skin melting effects that it's just out of this world. I'm glad you've, realized how amazing this film is and i have to be honest with you i've always liked this film but i didn't realize just how much i loved it until reviewing it it's such a great movie um i was i clapped i think twice with different death, <laughs> death scenes i don't often clap to death and murder um, but I do sometimes. Uh, it only not generally happens if I'm watching a movie and it's a real good comeuppance. And so, like I've done it uh, at Fright Fest numerous times. Someone's been killed and you clap, like watching Hostel uh, uh, Fright Fest, and the woman gets run over. One of the women. Yeah, that keeps I like that. I was, yeah, that, I was that, 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 that feeling. Like, yeah, I had that in this, and it. But I was doing it for not not the feeling that I was getting from it. I was doing it from the fucking effects. That shit is fucking the bomb. It's. I'm looking at the effects department, and it's a big department. I don't. No, no one. Uh, they've got any masters. The key. I only ever clap just quickly while we're talking about clapping. I, the only time I generally clap these days is when I watch Vamp and Grace Grace Jones does her dance, and I stand up with all the other men in the audience and just go. Uh... Yeah. The the, the 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 look the special effects credits is like crazy big. Good because um, they should have been. There's a lot of a lot of the effects in this. Like like I mean super super big. Just just this goes to show like this film uh, how grand it is. Do you know what I mean? Like the money. Just just take just example the the that amount of crew members. And that's well, one, here's, one here's part of budget. the film. Well, here's your budget. The film itself cost $19 million to make. $9 million of that was for visual effects. So almost half the budget went on the special effects. But why is that? I, I don't know. They just it, managed to... It's, it's, is it Chuck Russell going, look, I... We, 
I want this movie to be this. This has got to be this movie. In 88, like, at this point, slashers are starting to get a bit boring. They're getting towards the point of being like, oh, man, it's just another fucking copy. Um, there's nothing new going on. It's It's strange to be making this film right now. Do you know what I'm saying? And maybe that's why there's nobody in it that's particularly huge, famous, because... They couldn't really afford it. They they were like, look, we spent half the budget on the effects. We we just have to shoot. We just have to but, shoot where we can. But directed. Who we can. But you know, directed by someone who is just a, it's a second movie. Um, it's performed really well. Like they've got out the cast, like great performances. And it's is it because they've got a template already with the Steve McQueen one? Do you know what I'm saying? They've got something to go by I'm not saying I can't remember the original I think, did you watch <clears throat> it or can you compare it with compare I, I have seen the original I don't remember it very well I, I, it's obviously nowhere near as gory or anything like this yeah. um, in fact Chad McQueen they asked him if he'd want to be in this Steve McQueen's son and he he said no no I refuse to be in anything that's like a, a parody or a remake of anything my dad ever, has ever done Cause he's been approached to do things in here and there in the past um, he's a martial artist, actually. He's, he's been in a few Kung Fu movies. Um, I think what about what it is about Chuck Russell is he he likes he works with effect. He knows effects quite well because Dream Warriors, as you might remember, has got quite a lot of good practical effects in it. Uh, he then went on to really push the boundaries of CGI with the mask. Well, that, that's that, the, after part one. That's a fan favorite, isn't it? Uh, number three. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and after this, he went like you said, he went on to make um, the mask, which really pushed special effects. Yeah. Um, for quite an early part of the nineties, you know, and those effects they. Most of those still hold up quite well. I know with Jim Carrey being, you know, a real-life cartoon character in that, you know, it helped that Jim Carrey was who he was. But I, do, I just think Chuck Russell really likes to work with effects, uh, practical where possible, and, and and knows that if they're done right, that can make the film. Because that... But the thing is, nine million of the budget was spent on effects, but the film is still a very good film, even without the effects. Yeah. It's a, a very for a remake. It's, it feels very original. Must... It moves. At, it moves at a very quick pace. And like you said, everybody acts in it well. And um, actually, there are a couple of stunts in this with the motorbike and a few other moments that just look incredible. The mm. bit with the motorbike where he jumps the bridge and the helicopters above him and the other cars flipping over to the side. Yeah, yeah. There must have been a bit of spare pocket change going around from the slasher boom. Harvey Weinstein just left his wallet in a plant pot. Well, he started with Slashers, didn't he? Because he, he produced with his brother, um, Fimajiggy, the uh, fucking slasher movie set on the camp. Fucking hell. With the dude with the scissors, the blade on the boat the, kills the all burning. the kids. The burning, yeah. He produced the burning. That's his first movie. Anyway, Some there must camp. have been a bit of spare changing around from all that slasher boom because... You had to go and if you're saying that it was the director wanted to have the effects, you've got to go and say to the producers, uh, uh, I'm going to do this half the budget on effects. They're going to be like, no, you're fucking not. What are you talking about? So it's got to be to do with the producers. It, it, I don't understand why. I'm fucking glad they did. I don't understand why they went this route. Trying to get $9 million out of producers in the for, 80s. For just one department for effects. Well, trying to get $9 million anyway is hard yeah. for a horror movie. But trying to get $9 million where the budget is $19 million, yeah. he must have he must have sucked a few people off. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird one. Um, but well done, Chuck. But, but, Give it a little clap there because it's fucking brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 <clears> this movie, if you've not seen this film, please uh, probably stop this and go into it because you've got to check out these effects. I was blown away. And this this goes to stand the region, stand to reason that how great standalone visual, not visual, sorry, prosthetic effects are. Um, I, I, I love uh, I love digital effects nowadays I love the fact that you can just use digital effects to take stuff away rather than put stuff into the shot um, but uh, this, this this is like the thing you know um, it is and even to the point that they used a guy who was a triple amputee so he only had one arm and they made him they dressed him up to look like a victim of the blob yeah. um, so they did everything they so, could so to really this, push for this film the double bill is going to be the thing isn't it 
Oh, my well, what God. did we? It what did you say so well. about for the other film? What did you say? The Blob and um, no, the the stuff and you said something else for a oh, pairing. They they live. They live, and then with this you could see JC again, and with this yeah. you could do uh, the thing and this. Yeah, definitely, and there is a bit of that in this. This could be a John Carpenter movie. It, it, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, it, and that's a, that's obviously it's no detriment to Chuck I, Russell. And it, they got to be using the thing as a bit of a uh, uh, influence. Yeah, I mean, certainly some of the deaths are a bit maybe sort of like that. maybe at this point because obviously the thing got recognition later on in life. Maybe at this point they've started to recognise the thing and gone look. There's the, the effects like this. Look at that shit. And there's a few other bits in this that I really like. <clears throat> and we'll, when we get into it in just a second, they even use that whole psycho fake out where what we who we think is our main character after about 25 minutes just gets killed. Mm. Uh, so that's another little bit of originality, although it's borrowed from Psycho. Um, and, and even that callback that we talked about with with RoboCop, where Emil from RoboCop. Um, ends up getting melted just like he did in Robocop. So it's almost, they definitely knew what they were doing. And yeah. I think what it is, Gab, is it's made with love, this film. It's made with love. Uh, there's definitely uh, love. They wanted to make a good horror movie. They made a good fucking horror movie. Uh, I'm stoked by this. If I see this, I'll definitely add this to my collection. Yeah, I'd like to get a good copy of this. I did have it on VHS once um, in the last 10 years. And I must have got rid mm. of it. But you know what? Might be, I might have to have it. Weirdly, I remember this coming out uh, to rent, uh, and I never saw it, but I remember going in the VHS store, and I had a bit of a, a friendship with the guy who worked in our local video store, because he'd always give me the cardboard cutouts and posters. He, if there was one that looked cool, he'd, he'd sort of talk to me and my mum, and he'd write Daniel Bone on the back, so that when they took it down, we'd go by, and I'd go, oh, mum, it's the Moonwalker one, or whatever I wanted has come down, can I go in? And the man would be like, yeah, I'll put it behind the counter for you. And I went in there, and... Um, there was a, a window sticker that you put on your window, so it was like see-through, and it was a person pushed up against the glass, and it just said the blob on VHS or something underneath it. And it's about A4 size, yeah. and he kept it for me, and I rolled it up, but carefully took it home, and I stuck it to my bedroom window, and it was up there for a couple of years until, unfortunately, the sun faded it. But um, I remember oh, that was always stuck, and I'd never even seen the blob but yeah. I remember getting that sticking out my window thinking that looks cool I should check this the, film out I never saw it the video shop I used to sort of wander down to as a kid uh, a little a little way into town not too far and I would go in there and there used to be a a little box to the side when you go in and it was posters rolled up and it'd be free posters and yep. you'd just look in there and it'd be all the posters that they'd had from all the obviously the companies distributing the films and they would just be like some cool so I had loads of random horror movies to this day I've still not seen sitting up on the wall I remember having the Pit and the Pendulum with Lance Harrickson poster up on the wall never saw the film it's fucking I've still never seen it it's a big fucking poster my, my parents had to draw the line at a point because I had four or five of those giant cardboard cutouts mm. that they put. I had a Moonwalker one. Um, I can't remember all of them, to be honest with you, but I had so many of them that my room was just ridiculous. And my parents were like, you, you either have to throw some of these away mm. or you can't have any more. Yeah. And I had to really make the choice. Like, what do I, which, which one do I get rid of? Which one do I get? Th those were the days, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. All I've got nowadays uh, of anything like that is I've got a poster for Hostel, which was for You've advertising got that giant reasons. giant Hostel poster. I and remember that. It's, it's, what would you say? It's probably like... Six foot tall, maybe? It's probably mm -hmm. six, six and a half, maybe seven. And then it's probably like, what four or five foot wide yeah yeah it's like the a size of front a wall. cover yeah well you had it on the wall in that back bedroom and it took up the entire wall didn't it yeah it's ridiculous it's ridiculous poster cal that's the that's actually the biggest poster i've ever seen it's <laughs> ridiculous it's, i've no, i've never seen a poster that big in no, anyone's house no, why no, would you have that up? a size it's of like... a wall and i had it up for like years <laughs> it was out there in the back room where you dj for years yeah and and it'll probably go up again man Nice. I'm glad you've still got it. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, let's get into this film. <clears throat> we love it. So it's going to be a fun chat. So we open up on this little town in America, and we are at a American football game, or just a football game, as they would call it. Uh, we've got cheerleaders. It's all American. We've got cheerleaders, footballers. We've got jocks. Everybody's having a good time. And um, all the guys love Meg, the cheerleader. She is a hot cheerleader that they're all... Oh, you should ask her out, Paul. Paul, you need to ask her out. 
Uh, he does ask her out after he's tackled quite severely. Mm. He sort of lands on the ground. He says, do you want to go to the dance with me? She's like, I'd love to. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, we also get to meet this character called Brian, played by Kevin the Mullet Dylan. He's so young looking in this. He is. And he, he does is. almost look like a girl with a, with a mullet <laughs> rig on, though. I'm going to say that. Okay. Well, he's a badass, and we know that because he's on a motorcycle. Um, and he's riding around, and he's on his own. It's he thinks... Sigourney Weaver's haircut. That's what it is. He's got Sigourney Weaver's haircut. What, from Alien 1? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose he has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he's such is. a badass. He's out on his own, and he thinks... I'm going to jump that bridge over there. There's a bridge that's sort of broken in the middle. This is to thinks, show how cool this it. fucker is. So he does it, but he fucks it up, doesn't he? Yeah. And uh, his bike sort of crashes off the side. And some, and some, the... some like hobo with his dogs is like, yeah! <laughs> he sort of claps. He goes, <laughs> you fucked that one up. And he just goes off drinking. Yeah. That's, his, that's well, his audience. Yeah. Uh, we've got Sheriff Herb. Herb the Sheriff. From The Walking Dead. Oh. Is he from The Walking Dead? Yeah, yeah. Which one is he? I don't know. He's in The Walking Dead, though. Okay. Well, he asks out a lady called Fran, who runs a diner. So we're getting introduced to all these characters. Um, and she kind of think, seems like she blows him off, but then there's quite a sweet moment where she writes out the receipt for him, and on the back of it it says, I finished work at 11. And he's thinking, oh, yeah, brilliant, nice, cool. So we're liking these characters. We're, we're intrigued as to who they are. It's all good. Um, Brian, the guy with the motorbike, the mullet, he shows up in town and his bike's fucked. And uh, the sheriff, he jumps out the back of a truck, someone who's helped bring his bike back into town. And the sheriff spots him and he grabs him and he sort of warns him off to the side. He says, you know, you've been in and out of juvie your whole life. Just one more fuck up and you'll be in real prison now that you're old enough. Yeah. So he's... He's a bit of a rebel, this guy. We know that. The, and, and this the sheriff's, sheriff's, sheriff's just got it out for him, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. But he's a bad, bad news, man. He's trying to jump bridges on his motorbike. The guy's a badass. Watch out. With Watch Sigourney out Weaver's him. haircut. Well, Sigourney Weaver goes to visit her buddy in a garage. Yep. Uh, he's a mechanic. And he he fixes ice machines. Like... Um, vanilla Ice. Him and Vanilla Ice are in there dancing. And MC ice, Hammer says, ice, don't touch this. <laughs> listen. All right, stop. Collaborate and listen. Ice is back. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we, can't, we can't put the listeners through it. We can't do it. So, so he visits his buddy. Now, his buddy specializes in fixing snow plows, snow skis, and those weird machines uh, that you get that sort of clean hockey, ice hockey um, rinks, rinks. Yeah. Uh, and also one of them sort of spouts snow out of it as well or ice or something yeah. uh, stay tuned because that comes back into play later on Ooh. Ooh. and his buddy does say to him look I'm fixing all these sco- snow skis trust me we're in for a, a good snowy winter this year and he's like what are you talking about it's not going not to be any snow this year you say that every year it's not going to happen but he says can I borrow some of these tools because my bike's fucked up because I'm such a badass I tried to jump the bridge didn't work. I need to fix my bike. His buddy's like, yeah, go on then, borrow my tools. Me That's and my head trying to jump a bridge. Me and Sigourney. Sigourney Weaver's hair. That sounds like a good punk band. Sigourney Weaver's hair. Yeah. Now, while all this is going on, we cut back to that tramp, that pissed off old tramp that we saw from earlier, and him and his dog see a comet flying towards the earth. He's like, <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> And it, sort of sm- it smashes into the ground. Um, we'll come back to that in just a moment. And Scott and Paul, uh, this is hilarious. This, uh, this film is actually really funny as well because Scott and Paul, the um, footballers from earlier, they're in a, a chemist and they've got dates with girls. And uh, Scott says to Paul, you're going to need to buy some condoms. <laughs> and, Paul, yeah. and Paul says, come on, man. Uh, and he's like, look, I'm going to go and buy some. He's like, hey, my man, <clears throat> can I get get a pack of Trojans? And the chemist is like, okay, ribbed? And he's like, yeah, yeah, ribbed. And he's like, they're not for me. They're for my buddy over there. Um, he's, uh, he's too shy to buy them. And then the priest comes over just at this point as well and makes it even more. Imagine trying to buy condoms in front of your priest. And he's there going, how are you doing? 
How are you these days? Yeah. Have you been praying nightly? Oh, ribbed for her pleasure. Oh. Brilliant. Uh. Um, so, yeah, that that's quite funny. And that does come back to one of my favorite jokes in the film, which I, I always forget when I watch this. Um, so the Trump and their dog, much like the stuff, they go running over to investigate what this weird object is. There's a big crater in the ground and they are attacked by the blob. Yep. Jumps out of them. So we know that all that shit's going on. Now, these young boys who are Franz, who runs the diner, her boys are very keen to go to the cinema. They want to go and see Gardens Hall Massacre, don't they, Gav? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there's some dude behind. We all, we, we all know this person. We all know this dude. The person in the cinema. Well, no, actually, to be honest, I've never had this. I've only ever seen it in movies. The dude in the cinema that's giving you a running commentary just before it happens, so he's spoiling the film literally play by play. Yeah. Um, he's seen, he might have even seen it before, actually, because he sort of really well, of knows. He has. He, yeah, no, he knows. Yeah. Um, well, they, one of these boys is Meg, the cheerleader's brother, by the way, little brother. And this is also Fran's kid. So we realise that the owner of the diner, Fran, her daughter is Meg, and her little brother is is Paul, and his bo- his friend Scott. So we're kind of figuring there's a bit of a connection here. Um, now, Paul comes around, he knocks on the door and says, oh, hey, I've come to take you on your date. And she's like, oh, great, come in and meet my family. So here's he gets my mum, Teddy Ruxpin. Yeah, here's Teddy Ruxpin. Hi, I'm Teddy Ruxpin. Okay. I'm here to take you on a magical adventure. He also meets um, her little brother and his mate who are like, nah, we're off to sleep around each other's houses, but really we're going to sneak in and watch Garden Tool Massacre. And then she says, I'd really like it if you could come and meet my dad. Uh, and he walks into this room and there's a man reading a paper and he goes, nice to meet you. And he folds the paper down and it's the pharmacist that he bought Trojans off of. And, early on. and he, he, just even if it wasn't the pharmacist, it, it's the fact that this dude, you look at him, he's like, he just doesn't want, I just don't want this to be the dad of the girl I'm about to take out. He just looks like he, he's going to eat you. You know, can you imagine if you'd bought condoms off of this guy? Oh, and then even later worse. On, even worse. Later on, you've knocked on his door and said, "I'm going to take your daughter out." Wink, wink. Yeah. Ribbed for her pleasure, because he says, doesn't he? The first, thing, the only thing he says to Paul is, "Ribbed for her pleasure." And he's, and he's like, "That's your daughter, dude. You must be so pissed off." It's like that scene in *Neath the Weapon* where Riggs's daughter goes on the condom commercial. Oh, yeah, and he hates it because there's condoms everywhere when he, he goes into the, the station. Office. yeah, There's a tree on his desk with hundreds of condoms hanging on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not Riggs. Yeah. Uh, no, it is Riggs. No, it's no, Murtaugh. Murtaugh. Yeah, Murtaugh. It's Mur- Riggs doesn't have a daughter. What am I talking about? Rig- Riggs has turned them to all shut up. Says, hey, guys, shut up, shut up. Then he goes and writes something on the board or does something. Go spit, Riggs. Go spit. <laughs> So, night time, and uh, Brian sees a weird light in the woods. He's in the woods, and he sees this weird light. So he's out, just he's just riding around on his motorbike in the woods because he's a cool, cool guy. And he he finds the tramp with his hand severed. Instead of a hand, he's got this blob all over his stump. Hmm. He's like, "What the fuck? Are you all right? What what is going on here?" And he runs into, quite literally, runs into Paul and his date in a car uh and they hit the tramp and knock him over um and they do not like each other brian and paul they sort of have a bit of an argument about what they're going to do about this well you ran him over yeah but you cut his hand off i didn't cut his fucking hand off what are you talking about there's a blob on the end of it backwards and forwards backwards and forwards all right let's take him to hospital all right we'll take him to hospital so they take him in and they say we think there's some kind of acid or a corrosive substance on him so, all right, we'll have a look at this. Brian says, I'm going to go now because, you know, I don't want to stick around here. They'll only blame me. They blame me for everything in this town. Yep. What, they're going to blame you for cutting off a tramp's hand and pouring acid over it? You must have done something bad in your past. So Paul and Meg, this is their first date, let's not forget. And they decide to wait in the hospital together to make sure that this tramp that they've never met, that they've run over with a melting hand, is all right. Yeah. I'll have a first date. It's, well, it's memorable. 
Paul spots <laughs> something strange happening under the Trump's covers. Now, normally when you see a Trump with a cover over them, it's quite obvious something weird's going on under those covers. Lots of movement and blobbing and throbbing. But blobbing actually, and throbbing. Blobbing and throbbing, baby. So he gets the doctor and he says, come and have a look. Something weird's happening under the Trump's sheet. And the doctor pulls the sheet back. And this guy is pretty much just a head and a chest. The rest of him is just a puddle. Yeah, yeah. Well, just before it happens, his eyes sort of go white and stuff and when they sort of look at him. And that's creepy as fuck. It's so creepy the way he turns his head. And straight away, that got my attention in this movie. Like, from the get-go, I'm like, that, look, that's really well done. Was that a fluke? You know, is, is and then, like, everything's really expertly crafted for these bits. But, yeah, just... Yeah. It's a great effect um, because you... I guess he was under the the table uh, when they did it, and then they sort of did that whole thing where, I don't know, it just looks amazing. He's all melted, and they're they're trying to find a logical explanation. What do you think it could have been? Some kind of disease or illness? What the fuck would melt a man from the chest down? Think about it, guys. Jesus Christ. Yeah, uh, the score here is really good as well. Oh, we should mention that the score is phenomenal in this movie. Mm. Absolutely phenomenal, and a real good '80s, but quite a good. It would, it would suit um, like a thriller almost at times. Yeah, it's, it's a really good score. And you've also got to hear one of the, uh, someone from Twin Peaks as well. I can't remember who it was. I'm trying to have a look, but I can't remember. But yeah, someone from Twin Peaks. Well, Paul decides he needs to call the sheriff. And he says, look, sheriff, this this guy, this tramp that we, we kind of hit with our car has been run over. You need to, uh, He's been melted. You need to come and find out what the fuck's going on here. He's dead. While he's saying that, we see the blob behind him crawling up the wall. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's straight away you're getting a uh, thing vibe of this, you know. Oh yeah, totally, totally. It's like blub, 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 up the wall. What the fuck was that? Um, and it drops down on him. Yeah, and it, and it starts dissolving. And Meg runs in. Um, she grabs his arm, and tries to pull him out of the blob. His arm just comes off. Yeah. Fucking hell. Yeah. It is a memorable first date, Gav. Yeah. Um and. We, our hero, who we thought was our main guy, is dead. Yeah. 20 minutes or so in, dead. And it kind of takes, it changes roles, really, doesn't it? Yeah, because her mum and dad turn up. She's obviously upset, and they take her home, and, and they all suspect that it was Brian. I don't know what he's done in the past. That Whatever is so bad he's done is that they think he can melt people and kill them it's amazing that like, it, it actually it's literally a, a, a commentary towards people norms we can call them who look mm. at us guys who watch horror movies as fucking psychopaths and it's like no not really it's, like, it it's, it's ju- judging a book by its cover isn't it he rides a motorcycle and he's got Sigourney Weaver's hair it must have been him yeah and he's a bad bad motherfucker mm. and even when the sheriff they think even when the sheriff and Emil from uh, Robocop turn up, Emil, get your ass in the van. Um, when they turn up, they they all think, oh, well, it must have been Brian. I saw he was back in town the other day. Mm. I knew he's bad news. Mm. How the fuck is he melting people? He's... <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, we do, we, we go to a, a makeout hill, don't we, with this oh, couple? Oh, yeah. And this dude, this is what you got to have in the back of your car. you got to have a, this guy, a bar. I want to talk to You've you got about a full guy, cocktail actually. bar in the boot of your car. He's like, how does Batman. that work? And the police pull you over and say, Can I look in your boot, sir? And this lot comes up. They're like, You can't drive this around. I tell you what he's like. He's like um, Quagmire, you know, in his house Quagmire, when you yeah. press all the buttons and uh, from Frank, you go, you pre- all the different things pop out and flip around. Like Batman's house where the f- different things flip around. It's like that. Quagmire is hilarious, isn't he? Giggity goo. All right. Um, yeah, so, so he's with Erika Eleniak from uh, Baywatch, who is the lady who yeah. pops out the cake. She pops out the cake on um, Under, Under Siege. Under Siege, yes. The boobs out, yeah. What a birthday cake that would be if you were Steven Seagal. Hey, Steven. How are you doing? How are you doing, Yogi? Yeah, it's your birthday. We've got a Rika Leniak to pop out of a cake with the boobs out. I'm sure okay. he would probably be more happy of eating that cake, to be honest with you. Well, by the state of him, he's eating a lot of cakes these days, isn't he? Possibly. So anyway, Erika Leniak is quite drunk. Because I want this guy... to see you and him have a martial arts fight. I don't know why I said that in that voice. It, me and Steven Seagal. Seagal. Yeah, you're, you're a black belt, aren't you? I just push him over. He's easy. Oh, challenge. Come on, Seagal. 
come on. What can he do? Seagull versus Bone. I'd, I'd take him on. I want to see it. Cage match. Oh, Let's do it. Nick, what, Nicholas Cage is at uh, his house? Yeah. Oh, hi, welcome to Cage Match Volume 3. Hi, oh, yeah. We're going to have Dan Bone versus oh, Seagull. Yeah. Fight! <laughs> and Seagull's just saying, you can't understand what he says these days. He just mumbles everything. I'd push him over. He couldn't get up. He should, uh, he could, they could do a movie about, um, old oh, thing, Majiggy. It was in, uh, End of Apocalypse Now. Brando. Oh, right, Brando. Yeah, yeah. he could do, like, yeah. a, like, a biopic of Brando. He could, he would play him really well. So, yeah, let's go back to Scott and Vicky, who were making out in this car. So, Vicky is Erika Elenia, and she, Scott she is... She passes out drunk, doesn't she? Scott is a, a date rapist, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> so it's just, it's he's got around anyone's full, bush. No, because he's going to beat around a bush in a exactly. minute. He's going to try to. Uh, so he opens his boot, like you say, Gav, and he's got he's got a picture of margaritas in there, all made. It doesn't spill as he drives. I don't know how. He's got all these cocktails and fucking probably got some rehypno in there and everything else. Uh, probably some rope, and some gaffer tape and some leather gloves as well. And he brings a drink down, and she's like I just want to go to sleep and he's like no don't go to sleep and she passes out and he's like he looks around him like they're out right in the middle of the woods but he looks around him and goes well uh you must be pretty hot I'm gonna undo one of the buttons on your top here <laughs> he does one button then he does another button she's still not woken up at this point you probably think well she's asleep this guy doesn't he thinks I'm just gonna have a feel of your boob yeah well he gets what's coming to him, doesn't he? Yeah, my note does say 80s drunk woman touched up, and then I've got boob filled to disaster. Because she's got, for some reason, the blob is within her bra. Yeah. We don't know how it got there. It doesn't matter. It's there. <laughs> but it, it grabs his hand uh, and it melts him, and her face just completely caves in at this point. At least it, for Hollywood, well done. It does give the, uh, the uh, pervert a uh, comeuppance. The girl had to die. But the rapist got killed. So, yes, she he dies. Um, she dies. He dies. That's that. Uh, Meg's parents um, also think Brian is to blame. So Brian is getting blamed by literally everybody in the town at the moment. And this is where um, the blob slops along and goes into the sewers. Because everything's in the sewers in the 80s, wasn't it? The Ninja Turtles. The Chud, Vamp. vamp. Vamp was all in the sewers. Everything's in the fucking sewers. <laughs> Why is it with the sewers? In the eighties, don't fucking go in the sewers. Chad was down the sewer. Imagine that. Go, you go down there and you go, "Hey, uh, Raphael, so hey, dude, want some pizza?" Oh, it's fucking are, busy uh, down there, isn't it? There's a lot going on. Chad's down there as well, kicking around. It's all it's all happening down there. Um, go get the slime from Ghostbusters. That's down there. Oh yeah, I forgot about the slime. Fucking, there's everything down there. Grace Jones is wandering around. It's just like this really weird <laughs> coked out eighties party, isn't it? And then, and then you've what got, is going um, on? And then you've got a uh, fucking Rowdy Roddy Piper goes down there, and he's getting shown around. And they're like, "Oh yeah, there's a spaceship here that takes you to other dimensions." And big trouble <laughs> in Little China. <laughs> it will come out no more. What a weird journey down there. I hope they made that as a virtual reality game one day. I mean, you could just wander down there going, what is going on? Just ended up in, uh, what's his name for a big shovel little train that's full of, his room full of statues. Yeah. Hey, hey. That'd be well cool (laughs) seeing that dude coming towards you and doing his sword flying shit routine. Fuck that. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near him. Mm. Or that floating head with all the eyeballs on it. I still like the idea of the the weird... (laughs) sewer system with Grace Jones Dan Aykroyd in a slime fucking turtles Jesus Christ (laughs) Kurt Russell (laughs) Zorsogs what's going on and then the Goonies will probably end up down there as well I bet there's more we should have to we'd have to do a sewer episode a sewer episode (laughs) street trash it just goes on um, okay, <clears throat> so uh, where are we? So Emil, they've got um, Brian arrested. They've got him. They're holding him and they're harassing him. And Emil from Robocop, who is a, a deputy sheriff, he's really going in on him here. And the, the sheriff walks in. He says, "Look, we've got nothing on him. We're going to have to release him." So they release him. He goes outside, and Meg says, "Hey, I was going to come and, and post your bail for you." And he's like, 
why the fuck were you going to do that? And she's like, because I believe you. I, and I think we could, we could work together and figure out what's going on. And he's like, fuck off. And he goes in the diner um, and he, he says, hey, Fran, I know you're about to close, but can I get something to eat? She's like, yeah, yeah, okay, no worries. The reason she doesn't mind staying open a bit later is because she's told the sheriff she'll meet him at 11. So she's happy to keep things ticking over until 11 o'clock. However, Meg comes in the diner. She's like, look, I told you I need your help. He's like, fucking hell, you're persistent. Jesus Christ. What do you want? No one believes me. Yeah, they're not going to believe you. Um, they end up sharing a sandwich and having a chat. And there's a genuine sort of nice scene here where they kind of bond a bit. Her boyfriend has just been killed by the blob. They've witnessed some weird shit going on with the tramp and all that stuff. So they are kind of, you know, they start forging a little friendship here. And the cops now are searching the woods. I don't really know what they're looking for. Maybe the tramp's hand or his dog. I don't know. But they are searching the woods to try and find out what happened, what what the killer, what killed this guy, what what could be killing these people. So they, they get, they are, they're hunting through the woods. I, I don't think they necessarily know what they're looking for, but obviously something's not right. Well, they're searching, having a look, and then all of a sudden, you'd Sheriff says... think, though, because of the fact that this dude's melted, you'd think that they would have some more... In, get some people in who are uh, going to be wearing at least protective equipment for, like, something. Because, obviously, that isn't a natural thing. It's not a natural way of dying. Something is bad. We need Dustin Hoffman from Outbreak in his special suit. I thought you were saying from Rain Man. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm a very good driver. Oh, yeah, I'm a very good driver. Oh, yeah, I'm a very good driver. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, mm, okay, yeah. Good, good. What did he say about this, though? Oh, uh, blob, uh, blob on the hand, I'm um, sure. Yeah, um, he's got blobs on him. Um, his hand's melted. Very good. Mm, good driver. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump a motorcycle. Mm, so go to Weaver's hair. So, the sheriff remembers in the middle of this search party, shit, I've got a date. Fuck. Gotta go, guys. Yeah. Bingo. Got his date. So he heads back <clears throat> to go and visit Fran. And Fran, meanwhile, she's like, bloody hell, this drain is unblocked. It's blocked, isn't it, in the back of my um, diner? I can't seem to... Whatever's down here, it's not... I just can't get out. And her buddy says, step aside. I'll, this is... I'll do this. Don't you worry about it. She starts trying to unblock the drain. And uh, instead of the drain being un unblocked, he gets sucked headfirst into the fucking drain. Uh, again, these effects incredible. It's very much like the thing, this this bit with the legs and stuff. Um, I'd love to see some behind the scenes videos of, because I've seen a lot of behind the scenes stuff with the thing. I think there's a, I think there's a, I'm not sure who's released it. I think there's a special edition like Blu-ray which had like a. Uh, new documentary type thing uh, it would have definitely gone into that if not uh, it's only a matter of time before that's released I'm sure it's probably I'm sure there's a documentary on it out there there's got to be there's got to be something I'm, I'm going to might have a look on YouTube later on see um, see we should we're, we're like supposed to be like something like podcast that does like horror movie research <laughs> should have should have found it out sir I don't know I just like to talk about wanking you do indeed I, earlier, no. I, it was a note I kind of missed sorry from earlier on uh, you know in Kevin Dillon's uh, character he's uh, old Brian Brian Flagg Brian's um, arrested named after or he's by held. the way named after Randall Flagg from uh, the Stephen King uh, story The Stand oh very good and this has a, okay. this has a, a Stephen King feel to it by the way the source of the town and stuff you know? I agree this would be what would happen if Stephen King wrote a film that and John Carpenter said oh, I was going to say John Carpenter yeah yeah. Well, they did well, that, obviously that, that Christine. Christine, yeah. Me and um, you are the same, aren't we? Fucking hell, we say the same words even. Carry on. Kevin Dillon, uh, when he's being held by the police, he goes and licks the dude from Robocop's hand. No, his face. His face he licks. Yeah. Why? Why does he do that? Because he's a badass, Gav. He's a, he's a that rebel. That doesn't at any point make me think that, that person's <laughs> bad. I've licked people's faces. I'm a badass. Come on. No. No, you just need to be locked up, sir. <laughs> uh, anyway, jumping ahead, so, what, it, it pulled into the sink, and that effects is just incredible. It's just and Brian, Fran, and Meg all witnessed this. So now we've got several people witnessing this these death by blob, and the blob um, comes out of the sink and it lands on the ceiling. So they like, what the fuck are we going to do? So Brian and Meg run and get in the freezer. 
<clears throat> and this is where they first realize that the blob does not like the cold. So it tries to come underneath the door and then it instantly crystallizes and pulls back from under the door. So they're safe in there at the moment. It doesn't like the cold. While that's going on, Fran manages to escape into the alleyway. Um, she gets into a phone box and the blob starts sort of swishing around her and covering up the phone box. So she calls um, the sheriff and says, like, help, you've got to come and help me. Um, then she realizes that the sheriff is in the blob. Um, he gets squished up against the glass of the phone box and slowly. That's so good. I mean, it just sort of heads come by and stuff, you know. That's like the poster, really, isn't it? Like, um, like that pink effect with a face squished up against. And that was what I had on my bedroom window, that, that picture of like a guy squished up against the glass. Oh, really? It's like it's been digested. In fact, the description of the blob when they were writing the effects was, we want this to be like a stomach that's inside out, just a stomach, so that when you touch it, the stomach acid dissolves you like it would if it, if it was right the right way around so it's like going into a stomach but it's the other way around you know what i mean so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, so That's, it's like you're you are being digested essentially by this thing it's, it's crazy then you got this overhead shot of the phone box and the phone box explodes and it's oh, incredible yeah. it looks so good their choice of, their choice of shot doing it obviously it is sometimes the choice of shot is due to what's going to work for obviously the effect because you can't show everywhere because there's going to be secret people there wires or whatever this is just perfect the overhead shot so good i might um it's not often i watch a film in very close succession these days but i think with october looming i'm probably going to re-watch this for one of my 31 horror movies because it's just such a fun ride and it's fun to Obviously, when we watched it this time around, I had to make notes and really keep an eye out for all these little details. But I think I am I might just go back and rewatch this with a beer over mm. the Halloween period. It's just such a great, fun mm, I, I agree. I agree. I, I will be watching I'm this again. I'm getting excited talking about it with you again now. I'm just like, oh, yeah. That, yeah, yeah that I've, I, I, I've put down a perfect 80s film. Like uh, Perfect. It really is, yeah. It's up there with The Thing and The Fly. I've said it a b- bunch of times. Those three films are just um, insane. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, so she dies. Um, and so now we've killed off Fran. We've killed off her buddy, the sheriff. We've killed off the who we thought was our hero. So actually, no one seems to be safe. And again, I like that. It's very original. We're not sure where they're going with this, really. We get to see the priest now. He sees um, He sees the blob go down a drain. So he collects uh, a little piece of it, a little piece of the crystallized blob, and that actually comes back much, much, much later on after the towards the end of the film. Yeah, right at the end. Yeah, it's the last. Brian, it's the last scene, really. It's a weird ending, actually, but we'll come back to that. Well, well, um, no, it's just saying it, it's going to carry on, isn't it? Brian and Meg do see now. Every time I write down Brian and Meg, I always think of Family Guy for some reason. I'm thinking of Brian and Meg <laughs> from Family Guy. That's Never that's been. that's why it's working for you. That's why I love it. Uh, so Brian and Meg, they witness the, the – they, well, they get out of the freezer and they realise, you know, it was the cold that did it. Um, so they go looking in the woods. I don't really know what they're looking for, but they come across all the government agents, the ET guys, as yeah, I call yeah, them, yeah, yeah, yeah. in their hazmat suits. And um, they sort of say, hey, God, we're here to help you. It's a bit like the mist. We're here to help you. It's okay. Um and they talk about this alien bacteria that's fallen to Earth. Uh, it was on a meteorite. Um, and they... Oh, we go back now. So this tricks you now because suddenly you're in the, in the movie that's being watched by the boys in the cinema. Yeah, it's a kind of a Jason, Freddy thing going on, isn't it? The guy in a hockey mask. And he yeah, says, yeah. hang on a minute. It's not hockey season anymore. And that guy behind the kids, like you said earlier, is sort of, oh, he's going to kill the girl. He's going to cut her arm off. And yeah. then he cuts. And, and the boys, quite rightly so, keep turning around going, mister, can you shut up? You're but, ruining the movie for but us. But they, they've snuck in there. They're not old enough anyway. Haven't they? They've they got sh- their mate sh- to let them in there. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy in the projector room, um, he sort of. He's the one let him in. He's uh, he's up there and he's like, oh, it's getting really hot in here, actually. I'm going to oh, see yeah, what's wrong with the air conditioning. Yeah. yeah. So he puts his head in the uh, the air conditioning because he's a bit worried why it's so hot. And we just get a POV of what we assume is the blob. <laughs> Grabs him. Yep. He's killed. The usher goes to check on him. So the usher is their buddy. 
and he finds him on the ceiling. Like He finds his yo-yo, weirdly, coming down. I don't know if that's like a reference to Friday the 13th 3D. I don't know. The yo-yo no, pops down. No, it's not um, a reference to Friday the 13th 3D. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Because they had the yo-yo in that, didn't they? I, I guess they had the hockey mask thing going on in the fake video. And the, and the yo-yo, yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll uh, give yeah. you that loosely. I'll give you that loosely, but I don't reckon. You you often give it to me quite loosely, actually. No, I don't reckon. Um, <laughs> now, he's on the ceiling, uh, this guy, and he's been killed. Uh, and the usher gets killed as well. So we know it's in the cinema and we know if you've seen the first blob movie you'll know and we'll come back to that in a minute but you know in the very first blob movie um one of the reasons it didn't do very well was because initially it was because people in cinemas in the 50s there's a very famous scene in the original movie where the blob floods into a cinema and everybody in the cinema watching the film in the 50s got up and ran out of the cinema because it was the 50s and people were a bit more naive and thought well, actually, if that's happening on screen, that might just happen in a minute to me in real life. So fuck this. So quite a lot of sc- the first few screenings of the original Blob where people actually got out and ran out of the cinema because they were worried that the Blob was going to come and get them for real. Imagine that. That's mental, isn't it? What? Yeah. Hey, it was the 50s, man. Yeah, it was kind of like mass hysteria, isn't it? Yeah. So the scientists, they actually pretty much kidnap Brian and Meg um, they say they're going to do some tests. They want to leave, and they're like, you're not leaving. You're getting in the back of this van. So they, they put them in the van. Brian jumps out the van, and Meg, Meg gets left there. I love that. He's like, yep, yeah, I'm going. What? See ya. Because you kind of, out. What the fuck? Well, you expect she's going to jump out, but she's like, she just looks at him like, you fucking prick. You've left me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's gone. He's going to go back and get his motorcycle. That's what he's doing. So the whole town is currently being quarantined. This sounds familiar, Gav, doesn't it? The whole town is quarantined. Yeah. A bit like uh, 2020, huh? Mm-hmm. Um, Meg's parents realised... I had to realize... think what you're on about. What are you on about? Oh, yeah, that's what we live. The global pandemic. Mm. Meg's parents realise that her little brother is missing and they know he's at the cinema. Mm-hmm. Ah. Dun, dun, and, this dun, is where, dun. and this is where the blob blobs the cinema. It does. It That's does. My it does now start to resemble a large testicle. It is a giant ball bag. When it comes and falls out the door of the cinema, it looks like a testicle. Yeah, it does. Or a testicles. It looks like a few different things. Oh, there's another thing. It looks like a bit later on. Two other things, in fact, which we'll, we'll come to in just a moment. So it attacks the cinema. People start running out, screaming. Um, Meg obviously looking for her brother, goes back in, although everyone else is running out, to try and get her little brother. And she sees this huge blob is just killing everyone. She manages to find Kevin and his buddy, and they're trapped. Uh, they all get trapped in an alleyway, like a dead-end alleyway, and the blob's heading towards them again. So they jump down into a fucking sewer. Of course they do. With everyone else. And the guy from Vamp to from uh, Fright Night Two is down there at the end, and he's like, "Hey, it's fine, man. I'll just follow you guys along." And Grace Jones is doing one of her sexy dances with her zebra bum, and it's all going on down there. Mikey's watching with pizza and Raphael, Staying. Chuds in there. Chud, yeah. <laughs> I want to hang out down there, Gav. Ghostbusters, pink slime. It, it's a river of slime. It's loads of shit down there. It's Not great. just shit. It's not just shit. It's all not down there. Shit. Giant crocodiles. Well, let's not forget a giant crocodile. Alligators down there as well. Yeah. Fucking hell. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> they head down into the sewer. And there's some tentacles that start coming down the sewer. And they sort of burn Meg's hair. So we know this stuff definitely melts and burns, whatever it touches. Brian says, look, I'm going to sneak back and get my bike. Um, so he sneaks back in. And he hears the soldiers saying, look, we want, we want this town locked down. The people there are expendable. They want to use this basically as a. Uh, they think it'd be great for the weapons division. They and 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 actually they realise that this is a government created virus. So they actually sent a virus up into space, which mutated into the blob, and then it hit a meteorite, which then crash landed back on Earth. And they're very excited, like you say, Gab. They can use this as a biological weapon. Mm. So that's a really good little twist here. Um, 
and very it feels very original very fresh and again once again like with the staff and that it paints a picture of the, the government and the authorities as the bad guys yeah again it's, it's it's really fun um yeah the people are expendable we don't give a shit about them and brian overhears all this and it's his his job now to to save the day as it were so they track the blob into the sewers um brian gets caught cool and he manages to escape on his bike and this is where he does he finally does what he wanted to do earlier in the film then he gave him and scorny's hair jump the bridge they jump it and there's a helicopter behind him there's it's like an 80s bon jovi video it's just got everything explosions motorcycles jumps helicopters all you need is bon jovi singing yeah. Doesn't have that though. But it's got Bon Jovi's hair. So that's pretty cool. He heads back to town uh, to go and try and warn people and, and find people, Meg, I, I guess. And the scientists plan how they're going to trap the organism. So they've got a little cunning plan here. Meg and the kids are still in the sewers. Obviously, because they, they had a limited budget. They spent the majority of the budget on effects. So. Let's just keep shooting everything in the sewers as much as we can. I, I, well, I thought about it and I was like, well, did they make actually, did you make a set uh, for this or are you using location? Uh, if you are using location, what's the score of getting the gear down there? Must be another entrance, which is why. You said, you said this exactly the same thing when we talked about Vamp and uh, Fright Night because. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's that same same question, isn't it, really? But once you're using it, Karen using it, so I'm thinking probably a set. Really good scene here where there is, this is the first time we've seen what the blob can do when it's in the water and it's chasing them and we can't really see it because it, it's obviously like a, a liquid-style jelly and it melts a rat as the kids, the kids and um, Meg are trying to escape. And they start climbing up a pipe. Um, one of the kids, they, now that you never get this in horror movies, Gav, do you? Don't kill dogs or, or don't kill animals and don't kill children. But one of the children gets killed by the blob mm. and he turns into a bit what like jason Voorhees looks like in uh part nine jason takes manhattan when he's all melted in the sewer yeah. the blob stands up and at this point the blob looks like an anus it's amazing it looks like a big a big pink anus that's slightly um what do you call it prolapsed oh and it sort of stands up. This big erect anus stands up, um, and <laughs> it's a horrible thing. Uh, and <laughs> the soldiers show up and start Bill shooting Mosley. at him. Yeah, Bill Mosley. Bill Mosley shoots, <laughs> and he's he's presented with this giant anus, and he's thinking, "Am I just another Rob Zombie movie? Is that what this is? I don't know." Yeah. <laughs> Meg can't fit through the ratings, so the, she says to the kid, the last remaining kid, "Go on, go and get some help. I'm stuck here with this giant anus. It's horrible." Bill Mosley's there, um, so but luckily Brian saves Meg and he pulls her out through, jumps on his motorbike, and they do this amazing. Only only Snake Plissken is the only other person I can think of that would ever be able to do anything this cool, where they ride a motorbike through the sewers, and the blobs in front of them, so they ride it up the side of the sewer pipe. And then comes back down again, and they just move out of the way of the with block. the turtles, doing that it's same so thing. Cool. I wanted the Ninja Turtles behind him on their skateboards doing Come that. Come on, dude, Cowbunga! Follow that guy with the hair. He's got cool hair. <laughs> Is that the guy from Alien? Can someone, <laughs> Shut up, Mikey. <laughs> can somebody Photoshop, please, just all of this into one shot? Uh, we should ask that guy on Facebook. Yeah, Jim will paint. paint it. Jim will paint it, get him to do every 80s character in the sewer. That took place in the sewer all in one shot, please, for the love of God. He did it recently with um, Arnie, where it was kindergarten cop, but instead of children in the picture, it was all of Arnie's characters from different movies. Amazing. So, Ar- so he was stood there in the middle, like he is on the cover of Kindergarten Cop, and he had a little mini Terminator, a little mini um, Mr. Freeze, uh, the guy from uh, Jing- Jingle All the Way, Commando. Everybody was all hanging off of him, like screaming, like, oh, oh, oh. it's so good. I'll find it and I'll send it. I'll put it on the Facebook page. Yeah. It's really good. Really, really good. Yeah, he dodges the blob on his motorcycle. Um, so a couple of soldiers managed to lead them out. Uh, but 
the government decide, no, 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 you're not getting out, and they close the sewer lid. They just drive over it and put a wheel of a vehicle on top of it to weigh it down. Fucking hell, Gav. It's all right, though. They use a rocket launcher, which Bill Mosey happens to have on his back. Bill Mosey's always going to have a rocket launcher on his back, Gav. And he's there just freaking out totally in Bill Mosey <laughs> wide-eyed style. Brian grabs a gun. Um, so they get out, and Brian grabs a gun, and he tries to convince the town that the soldiers are bad and the blob is man-made. No one's going to believe this guy. They all hate him. He's got ridiculous hair and they all think he's melting people with acid powers. They're not going to believe him at this point. No. Um, but he does what he does and the main scientist gets pulled down into the sewers. He gets killed. So the other guys go, well, look, we're going to need to drop this bomb down in here. So again, it's a bit like the stuff. Just put a bomb out of nowhere. Yeah, and at this... At this point here, is, uh, he had some music playing which sounded very much like John Carpenter. And it, this scene was like, whoa, this feels really John Carpenter-y with like, the other soldiers and, you know. It's funny that both of these movies we've covered in this episode do feel very, very John Carpenter, don't they? Mm, mm. And I think that's because, and that's your answer to your question you asked me earlier, so you started off by saying Larry Cohen's very punk rock, as we know John Carpenter is. And I think the reason that film is so unique and the reason this film managed to get a budget of 19 million with only 10 million going to the actual film, the rest effects, is that there's just this I don't give a fuck vibe about it. And whatever Chuck Russell said or told the producers, they they just bought it and said, do you know what? I believe in this guy. He's going to make this. Just let him fucking make it. Hmm. I think that's it. He just he just went for it. Yeah, it's brilliant. The blob, it gets pissed off at this point, and uh, it come it, it is huge. It comes out and it looks like. So my notes here say it looks like a giant cock or a giant tongue. Yeah, because it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it comes, it, it's quite big. <laughs> it's quite big. It's a, it's a big lad. It's a big lad. Who's you said about Candyman? Yeah, he's a big lad. He's a big lad. Yeah. Big lad. Hook on his hand. Don't say his name five times. He's a big lad. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Just saying that, I'm, I'm, I'm in my head. I was saying that in Idris Elba's voice. He's a big lad. Yeah. He's, he's and now I'm lad. thinking, I want to see Idris Elba as Candyman. I'm thinking he would make a fucking good Candyman. Or oh, don't say my name five fucking times. I'll come and bite your fucking head off. Right? I'm yeah. a big lad. He's a big lad. <laughs> Big lad. Um, yeah, so uh, the giant cock tongue comes out the ground. It starts eating people, devouring people on the street. This thing is huge at this point. And the priest, a suit, the priest from earlier, he's like, it's judgment day. Oh, okay, I get it. I understand what's happening. This is like, God, he starts spouting loads of Bible shit. Um, and somebody grabs a flamethrower. Matt wants the flamethrower. Uh, it doesn't work. And the course. blob sets the dude on fire, though. Sets him on fire. Brilliant. That worked well. Good luck. Good lad. Good lad. <laughs> Meg uses a fire extinguisher because she remembers that it doesn't like the cold. So she's very clever. And she freezes it a little bit with a fire extinguisher. Everybody heads inside this building. Um, Brian, he, t he, uh, he talks to the, uh, he, sorry, he takes the truck from earlier, the ice making machine truck. Um, Emil from Robocop what happens here he gets snapped in half and then melted just like in Robocop good lad dude, dude has died well hasn't he just that, those two films do you remember when I put up on Facebook ask me my top three anything and somebody said what were your top three deaths ever Emil in Robocop is one of my top three deaths of all time because of the age I was when so I watched gnarly, it gnarly man yeah I was about 10 when I saw Robocop, which is way too young. And the fact that he's just melted and, and Clarence Boddicker just shoves him in front. No, not Clarence Boddicker, that other guy just shoves him out of the way and he gets run over and explodes. It's like... It, that, that We've talked about it before, but Robocop as a kid, just being my parents go, yeah, go go down to that shop, get any move you want. All right? tell, tell the person behind the counter, let him have whatever he wants. I love the fact that that it's basically saying this is not what you're allowed to do but the unwritten law is if your mum and dad just tell me it's cool 
you can have anything you like. That's not how it's supposed to work. <laughs> In the 80s, that's how it worked. So, yeah. Well, I, I remember um, Alice telling me that, I think it was Alice was telling me that she used to go down the shop and buy cigarettes when she was a kid. Her mum would like send her out. Yeah. Come, come and get me some fags. Just tell the man it's for me. So you're 10 years old. Mummy wants embassy, embassy number ones. All right, there you go. They're yeah. definitely for your mum, yeah? Not for you, little eight-year-old girl. Yeah, definitely for my mum. But there's also, like, a trust thing, which went on a bit. But then again, the trust thing, you're trusting just people that aren't going to smoke cigarettes. But I was still going to watch fucking Robocop. And I watched Robocop and went, ah, Well, when I, told, when I told my dad I'd watched it, um, I probably didn't tell him until I was probably a year later. And he said, oh, right, I've not seen that one yet, but isn't that about a superhero, Robocop? And I said, mm, yeah. And then he saw it. And he was like, I'm really angry that your friend's mum let you two watch that when you were 10. That's really bad that you watched that. Yeah, I, but I, then... I, 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 it's so weird. I wouldn't want my kids to watch it. See, I'm terrible. But then, off the back of that, Dad then realised I could handle that kind of stuff. So he was like, I've told this story before, that he was like, you know, Big Trouble in Little China, I've got a movie by the same guy with... Kurt Russell called The Thing. Do you want to watch it with me? And I was like, uh, I was about 12, 13 maybe. And I was like, yeah, all right, cool. Dad wants to watch a film with me. Let's check it out. And that was like, oh, shit. Yeah, I've, Jay's asked me about it. <laughs> and I've said, yeah, okay, I will. Um, we go on to it at some point. We keep going to watch, but we haven't done it yet. What was it we keep going to watch? It's a classic. Oh, she wants, um, so, they want so, uh, Science of the Lambs. No, 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 The Shining. Um, and I keep getting to it, but I keep saying, I, I kind of feel like with The Shining, I don't think you Jay need would to like be that. a bit older. Yeah, I don't think Jay, because I, I remember Jay didn't like um, Wicker Man because they said it was boring and it wasn't scary. And I guess that's why I want young, them it's not to really watch The Shining at a later date, I feel. Yeah, to get to get not because of the content, because I don't think it'd be understood properly in its right context. Right, anyway, carry on with this film. Sorry, it's, no, it's good, little, good little tangent though. Uh, so Emil Emil's killed. Uh, Brian switches on the snow machine, so which we talked about earlier, and he starts driving the truck out, but the truck gets tipped over, and the blob starts devouring the truck while he's inside it. And this is where Meg becomes a bit talking of Sigourney Weaver. She becomes a bit Ripley at this point, doesn't she? Yeah, she she, she's the one who figures out that, uh, that figures out that it doesn't like it, uh, uh, the extinguishers. She, yeah, yeah. She she starts shooting at the blob. Um, With just a fire extinguisher, yeah. She lures it over to her into a bomb that she's got, and uh, boom. Boom. She, she saves the day. That's it. She fucking explodes the blob and it does indeed start snowing. Yeah, like snowing bits of the blob. And they're like, right, let's get this while it's on ice. Get it on ice and get it to... Where do they take it? Uh, they ship it off to... I don't know. They ship it off somewhere, don't they? But Brian says one of the most 80s things ever at this point. He says, what a rush. Yep. Um, yeah, I told you we'd get snow, says his buddy. And we get the epilogue now. And that's it, by the way. They saved, you know, Brian, Meg, they will save the town. The, the blob is crystallized and frozen. And then we get this weird, weird, weird epilogue, which I don't know what I think of this epilogue, where the priest, who's been popping up and down all the way through this film, he's giving a sermon out in the middle of nowhere, and he's got quite a burnt face with a patch over his eye. Um, or has he got sunglasses on? Uh, it's a patch over his eye. And then he, he finishes his sermon and he goes in and he looks in the mirror and he lifts up his patch and he's got this weird burnt eye. And then he's got a piece of the blob in the jar and he says, uh, basically, it's a way of... What does he say? It's it's not a patch, by the way. It's actually just where his face is deformed and one of his eyes is white where it's, uh, the fire is. But he's basically got been burnt. And he says, the day of reckoning is coming. The Lord will give me a sign when I need to start it up. So he thinks that Blob is like Judgment Day. And yeah, he's he started up, but he's almost like a cult leader type thing. He started up his sort of thing and people are listening to him and he's got his jar waiting to release it. So yeah, it, it, I don't think they're saying for it to be a sequel, but definitely like yeah, having know, like this night twist it. ending sort of thing as well. It's cool, I like it, you know. Well, it's not twist, yeah, I, but follow on. It's the, only, it's the only part of it where I'm a bit like, uh, 
could have I could have done without that personally. That's me being honest. But I'm not going to let anything take away from the fact this film is a solid, solid eight out of ten. Um, yeah, I give it a seven film. out of ten. Um, it's a, it's a definite, uh, say definite recommend and thumbs up. It's it's incredible and it's almost like I've rediscovered it rewatching it for this episode. Indeed. Um, um, right. There we go. That's the blob from Wait. 1988, guys. Uh, Bill Murray. Bill. I'm glad Bill was on on point last episode. Was actually in place. Where Bill. Should be. Bill. Bill. Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. Strange world. It is a strange, strange world. Now I've got two stories for you, Gavin. We had a strange thing earlier, didn't we? Earlier, ladies and gentlemen, you would have heard a bang going on in Dan's vicinity. Uh, There there was a sound, bang sound, while I was talking earlier, and you guys probably would have heard it because I heard it. Uh, Dan did, in a slight break, go and investigate to no avail. He, He found nudder. There was a massive explosion in my hallway, and my wife was in the living room. She didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. I checked everything in the house. Nothing seems to be amiss. I couldn't tell you what it was, but it was such an loud explosion that it, it probably would have been picked it up would, on the intro. It would be. I know it was in the uh, first film, I think, review. Was it? Yeah. It was so, very loud. So, one, you guys, everybody would have heard that. So, that was a ghost sound. And that, well, we would record in. Uh, it's we recording once in the chair next to you moved, didn't it? Yeah, the chair moved, yeah. I didn't have video on, which I was gutted with because I would have seen it. Um, I shot myself. I leapt a foot in the air because you just to you, the go, chair just ah! moved. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting. Um, so it's funny we got that sound early and you can't find what it is because I thought, I assumed Alice had dropped something tidy well, enough in the very living room. Loud. It was fucking Whatever well it was, loud. It was really loud. It was loud like. And it was in here, wasn't it? Your neighbours. It sounded to me like... Um, well, in it honestly sounded like a firework could be put through my letterbox. It was a, such a loud bang. It mm. sounded like some, some idiot had thrown a brick against my front door or something like that. Yeah. But it was nothing. Yeah. I mean, I'll probably go out in the morning and find a brick next to my front door, but... Possibly. <laughs> they right. know where I live. What's going on? So, two stories for you. Well, I'll we'll start off with the one that's related to the films we've just, we've just reviewed. Yeah. So, the first one is all about the blob. A real life blob. Okay. So there's a zoo in Paris, and they've got a real life blob. It's an organism that's self healing. And get this it's got 720 sexes. Really? I only thought there were two sexes. Yeah. Not sure. So. There's a star attraction at a new zoo in Paris, and it defies your expectations. It looks like a fungus, but it acts like an animal. Technically, it's an organism, which has just been called the blob, but it's neither an animal nor an organism or a fungus. It doesn't belong in either the plant or the bacteria kingdoms. It's a slime mold, and it defies classification. So it's new shit. It's relatively new. This this is last year. This story. And they don't know what it is, or it just doesn't. It just doesn't. Well, they know what it is, but it does. It defies classification because it doesn't fall strictly into either classification. That's interesting. What does it do? So, well, let me explain what it does. It doesn't have a brain, but it can solve problems. You mean like if it had to travel, it would figure out how to get over a gap. It has no eyes or mouth, but it can find and digest food. Okay. If you cut it, if you cut it in half, it repairs itself like Terminator Two. It's bright yellow, so I will obviously post this up on the Facebook page. Um, it's bright yellow, and it's called Fisarum polycephalum. What happens? And it's... What? What happens on skin? Why? Right, let's read through it. Right. It was first discovered in Texas in 1973, and they've been. They've been uh, studying it for several decades, and they decided to showcase it at this zoo in Paris. Um, 
the blob can learn to avoid toxic substances and it remembers for up to 12 months so it will remember stuff like it will remember an obstacle or a substance it doesn't like it fuses with other molds or fungus and then it basically shares so if you get two of them and you teach them separate things if you put them together they fuse together and they remember both things as one entity right it's pretty weird isn't it mm -hmm. you can go to the paris zoological gardens and see this on display it can figure out its way out of mazes it can solve basic problems like like i said earlier there's something in front of it it doesn't like but there's something in front of it, it does like it'll go for the other thing um it's a living being it's one of nature's mysteries says Bruno David, director of the Museum of Natural History. Is it one of its, its coin? Well, I think it's fairly new. They don't know much about it, to be honest with you. Even though they discovered it in the 70s, they said, what surprises us is it has no brain, but it seems to be able to learn, and it can pass knowledge on from one entity to another. This is the bit I really get confused about. It's got apparently 720 sexes. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means, Gav. Well, uh, I'm assuming it's got so many molecules, and each molecule is a different sex. I have no idea, but it can move at a speed of 1.6 inches per hour. That's quite quick for a slime. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Oh, right, so it's a real life slime thing. Yeah, it's a real life blob. Um, and, and that's really the story, really. I just wanted to very quickly let you know that there is a blob out there. I want to see what it there. does There's... on something, like put it on something living. Apparently, if you cut it in half, they both carry on living like an earthworm separately. Yeah, but yeah. then at some point, if you put them back in the same container, they they'll just fuse together. back together. It's so fucking weird. And it looks weird. It looks like something out of Prometheus or something. It's just this yellow, weird fungus. So what would happen if someone swallowed it? <sighs> You'd probably become... Like one of the people from the stuff. I guess so. Start eating shaving cream. What's your other story then? Is it going to be more disturbing? Here's the headline. <laughs> this is the way you do that. You even folded your arms when you did it. I love yep. that you're swigging some booze before you do it. I'll just get ready. Here's the headline. A woman sawed off her own hand. Mm. Guilty, she's found guilty of fraud. And they've got a picture of a big an angle grinder. Uh, what country? Slovenia. Right. A Slovenian woman has been found guilty of deliberately sawing off her own hand as part of an insurance scam. Oh, shit. I thought it was going to be some old school custom and she'd done something criminal... And she was told to cut off, cut off her own hand. No. Like she wanted some, or something. She uh, wanted some money. Well, people do this shit, though, don't they? When I mean, they're desperate. But that's more desperate because that means you've only now got one arm. This is an issue. Mm. How much did that cost you? An arm. An arm and a leg? Just an arm. What? So how much was she trying to get? Well, I'll come to that in just a second. It does say. Yeah. Uh, so a court in the capital of Slovenia uh, found that Julija Aldelsic, 22, had taken out five life insurance policies the year before her injury. She claimed that the injury happened as she was cutting branches. If she'd have succeeded, she'd have gained uh, 1 million euros which is £900,000 or £1.16 million US dollars in payouts. However, she now faces two years in prison and her boyfriend, who is in on it, has been given a three-year sentence. So her and a number of relatives were arrested last year, 2019, after she arrived in hospital with her hand cut off just above the wrist. And the court found that her and her boyfriend had intentionally left the severed hand behind back in the garage rather than bringing it with them to ensure that the disability was permanent and they couldn't sew it back on in time. Okay. Do you think they did like rock, paper, scissors? Like, who's going to cut the hand off then? Me or you? All right, we'll do rock, paper, scissors. No, it's probably an abusive uh, relationship type thing or one 
the guy being like, nope, you were fucking doing it. Well, her boyfriend apparently made internet searches about artificial hands a few days beforehand. What an idiot. You can find, you, we can trace everything you've just searched on the internet. Well, um, they're obviously not a bright couple anyway, are they? <laughs> of course, they've got a fucking hand off. They're not up, right? How are we going to pay these bills? Cut your hand off. All right. She's going to regret this all her life. Yeah. So they said that this internet search history was proof that the injury was intentional. Um, her boyfriend's father was also given a one-year suspended sentence, so he was in a right as well. So they'd all planned this. Uh, throughout the trial, she denied intentionally cutting her hand off. As I said, had the frame claim be, uh, been successful, the couple would have received more than half a million euros as a lump sum, and the rest would have been paid in monthly instalments. However, she's now doing time. With one arm, one hand. What happened? Oh, I was cutting off a branch. Oh, no. Can I have some money? But when they say to her, like, in prison, what are you in here for? Uh, cut my hand off. Try to get some money. Didn't get the money, you did you? Dick, you dickhead. So, like, you didn't get the money, did you? That's why you're in here. Yeah. So you basically put yourself in prison with one hand. It makes it even worse. They call you Stumpy. They definitely call you Stumpy. Oh, you Stumpy. There we go. For help. I'm glad it wasn't too disturbing. It wasn't... No, it wasn't too bad. A real-life blob in Paris and a one-armed woman in prison. Yeah, but yeah. That's not too bad, actually. You know, sometimes you let me get off all right. I let you get off. Sometimes. What time do you get off? Three, about three <laughs> o'clock. Can I watch? <laughs> Can I watch? I'll never forget her for the rest of my life. All right, let's get out of here, dude. Okay, let's, see you in let's the go. Show, Come back, yeah. Mm, Bill. Bill. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. And oh, we're back. In the outro to the show. To the show, toe. That was fun, wasn't it? That was sticky. I feel a little bit, uh, a little bit gross after yeah, those two a films. Little shower, but yes. Yeah, and maybe I'll get in a, a naked hot tub. Cool. Clean myself off that way. Hey, hey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was that. What have we got coming up next, Gav? Do you want to know? Omen. Oh yeah. Episode ninety-nine. Yes. The Omen and Rosemary's Baby. Interesting. Strap, strap yourself in for a couple of classics. There. It's gonna interesting. Be good. Yeah, really interesting chat about them films, definitely. And then it will be our hundredth episode, which brings me back to what I said in the intro which is please guys if you want to send us emails um, the podcast on Haunted Hill at Outlook.com or just drop us a DM or a PM whatever you want to say uh, with a voice clip or a question or a comment or whatever it is we will play it we will read it out we really want to celebrate um, what we consider a milestone our 100th episode um, it's only taken us 7 years to get there which Indeed. is fun. <laughs> um episode 101 as long as we can do this that will be our Halloween special Halloween and as, and as long as we can do this and get together we are planning on doing another commentary this year it will be The Exorcist Your Mother Sucks Cocks in Hell yeah we should be able to do that we're going to we should definitely yeah, try should. and do that uh, even if it's with masks on sat two metres apart we'll do it we yep. will do it so that's what our next three episodes are looking like now we do have some questions and comments um but people hot off the press as they say uh related to this episode or just related to us generally so i'm just going to run through these now gav uh and then we'll then we'll wrap up the show with a little bit of admin got him. all right hmm. okay so we got a couple from court psyops first of all fellow legion brother in podcasting court hello court good evening or, or as court likes to say fuck you because he does like to say fuck you quite a lot. In fact, nobody swears quite like Court, so I just wanted to mention that. He's a hell of a swearer, this guy. A um, couple of his comments. First one he says is, The Blob remake from the 80s may be one of the most well-made Redux films to expand on the original. It makes an amazing companion piece... Oh, here we go. It makes an amazing companion piece to Carpenter's The Thing to somewhat lighten the mood as the second feature. And that's 
good shout. You'd start off with the thing, then you'd probably move on to the blog, wouldn't you? That's a good shout, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's what we said. Hmm. Uh, his next comment is, um, oh, this is, oh, this is a good one. As a kid, I always thought about a thing versus blob flick since the blob is sent to the Arctic. Oh, that's where they sent the blob at the end. They sent it to the Arctic. And that's where the thing is. So the question is, he says, the question is, who would absorb who and what would the end result be? Oh, fuck. Now, after watching the blob, <laughs> after watching the blob, I looked to Sarah and I said, who would win, thing versus blob? And uh, she went thing, no doubt. And I was like, yeah, the thing. So I'm going thing. I think the thing is so fucking gnarly. I think the thing's cause... fucking rock and roll. What's it metal, assimilate... isn't it, the thing? Thing's metal. It would assimilate the blob, wouldn't it? Yeah. And then you'd have a blob thing, and that would just be too gnarly. Too gnarly. Oh, and then he's put, and then he's put, then I would watch the, th- the, the third movie in this marathon would be then The Stuff. Uh, and that would be for your mates who parted too hard during the first two films and needed to sober up. So you've got your mates with you watching The Thing and then The Blob, and then it's time to sober up with The Stuff. Is that a come down with The Stuff? <laughs> Fucking hell, that is, that is a hell of a trilogy right there, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, he's got another comment as well. He says, The stuff is Prime Cohen. It's an exploitation movie idea, a smoothie of... He said, is it, sorry, it's an exploitation movie idea, smoothie of awesome. It provides a thinly veiled social, social critique on consumerism and marketing that's handled with its tongue firmly in its cheek. Indeed. The cast is spectacular and it's not a frame of the film that feels like filler. The stuff would make a great third film of the night for the folks still too inebriated to head home with ample time to sober up at your movie party. We agree. That is fucking awesome. And also, really good. I'd I really love to see The Thing versus The Blob. Yeah. Um, much as I'd like to see Chucky versus The Leprechaun. So, no. no. Okay. No? Okay. Um, another question here from somebody called uh, Dan Bone. He says, question for Gab. What are your top three favourite things about your co-host? So are, you, are you telling me you are asking me now what I... This is someone's what top put things about Facebook. you. This is... Um, Someone's put this on Facebook, Gav. Uh, look, you're, you're my twin. <laughs> we, f- we think the same, like our brain is actually connected somehow. Uh, your beard. Yeah. Uh, that's it, that's three. That's, that's three. Oh, yeah, cool. There you go. Uh, in fact, Court follows up my question with a follow up for Dan. Why do you require Gav's external validation? Because, Court, Gav's just said it himself, he's my twin, and. If you can't get validation from yourself, then who can you get validation from, really? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, there's a good answer. <laughs> uh, Matt Tangent, Matthew Tangent, question for Gav. Hello. Are you deeply hurt by Dan Bone constantly cheating on you with RJ McCready? <laughs> <laughs> this is the bite size cinema thing going on, isn't it? Which, by the way, little plug, I recently recorded an episode where we discussed the 1988 movie Willow. So check that one out, bite size cinema podcast. Oh, yeah, Gav, how do you feel about me constantly cheating on you with RJ McCready? Mm, uh, I think it's absolutely fine. I did actually start what uh, listening to Unbreakable and enjoying that, but then I started to enjoy it to the point where I, I had to stop because I was thinking I might have to watch Unbreakable again and I didn't really want to hear what you said because I think it's the once when it first came out. So, yes. Uh, yeah, I don't mind. You, you go ahead. You do your thing. You say your oats. Court follows that one up with, when are we going to get a three-way with you guys? So me, you, and RJ. Uh, yeah, we can, we can, we can probably do something. I've got something in the pipeline for that, which I have yet to speak to. I've spoken to Gab about, guys, but I haven't spoken to RJ about. It. Sorry, RJ, to drop you in here. So we'll speak to you about that. There is a potential. I don't remember what that conversation. That's all right. Was. There, there is a movie that I know that RJ would probably want to come and chat to us about on our show. Okay. Um, but alternatively, we're happy to... We've both been separately on his show, so, mm. you know, you know. And final question is from Matthew Godley. This is a bit of a spooky one. He says, question for you both. What's the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? I know my answer. Mine, I, um, mine's either paralysing myself in San Francisco or... 
I remember crossing a train track in the middle of the night because there's nothing coming and I just got on the train track and the train went past at full speed. Fucking hell. Literally just got my leg on. It's like, um, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Fucking hell. Then I had a donut from under a bench, but that's another story. All right. What? Doesn't matter, I was hungry. Gone. <laughs> Scariest thing that's ever happened to me, keeping it light and keeping it supernatural, I'd probably say uh, was genuinely when Gav and I were in a graveyard um, at really late at night, midnight. It was very foggy and we both heard that weird horse noise. The horse sound. And there was such a such a weird atmosphere in that graveyard. I genuinely felt the most scared I've ever felt in my life for about five minutes to the point of obviously as you know i was holding your arm i was so afraid that's brilliant that you, everybody can actually view this because we filmed it yeah but the horse noise doesn't come out on the video does it no it didn't which is weird because we both heard a sort of thing and it was it like a trotting around as well it's just like the sound of a horse it was just movement. the sound of a horse yeah it was just like a sort of noise and that um, was like, and it's really close to us and it's like why is there a horse in the graveyard in the middle of the night you turn around and it's like there's no horses and I said to you, well, it's probably next door. Is I've got a horse. Middle you, of the said, Gav, uh, you said, Dan, shut the fuck up. There's no... And the next day you took me back there in the daylight and proved to me there is no no, no house around there with a stable anywhere near Absolutely there. Absolutely no way. I don't know how we heard a horse. And why would we hear a horse? Well, even if it's that... a ghost horse, why is it a ghost horse? The whole atmosphere to me that night was particularly, but just very spooky. That was Halloween. That... That's, where we... that... That's the night we met RJ. It was. We went to see John Carpenter that night. Yeah. It was. Yeah. There we go. There you so go. Thank, thank you for, thank you for that. Guys, Cheers, dude. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Okay, well, let's let's wrap up with a little bit of admin. So, as always, Podcast on On Today is a proud member of Legion Podcasts. Um, you can find more about them on legionpodcasts.com. Um, you can find more about us on uh, the podcast on haunted hill on facebook we have a facebook page go visit that join us chat to us comment like chat to us message us it's all good um legion have their own podcast pa facebook page as well um same thing legion podcasts and you can find out there's a ton of shows including rj's show court sarp show everybody else's show uh, is on there it's it's amazing there's so much going on we have an email address Again, please, please, please send us Dan really wants some mail. Can you please send him some mail, people? I'd like some messages. Just anything. If, like I said, just say the word twat. Subject twat. Message twat. <laughs> the podcast on Haunted Hill at Outlook.com is our email address. It's new. It's sparkly. It's shiny. Um, you can find more about us on uh, several platforms, um, including um, Podknife, Podbean, um, the uh the itunes app whatever it's called these days and you can a lot of these again we'd love it especially some of our newer listeners or our patrons if you could leave us a review it really means a lot to us and also yeah. it boosts it boosts us and our ratings if you can leave well it gives reviews. other people to hear the show and we'd love to spread the word spread the joy yeah. if it is joy on. or you listen Spotify. to this because you hate us and you live in a world where you just want to hate and you just dislike us if you want to spread Wrong. that spread that we're on Spotify, we're on YouTube as well, um, we're on Podcast Addict app, we're, on, uh, we're everywhere. Um, we're on Twitter, if you just go at Haunted Podcast, we're on Instagram, which is the Podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. We also have our production company, Deadbolt Films. You can go to deadboltfilms.com, you can go to our YouTube channel, just type in Deadbolt Films. Mm -hmm. You'll find out more about World of the Strange, where Gav and I heard a horse that wasn't there. was <laughs> like, <laughs> brilliant. We listen to something that you hear no one else is. Yep. So fucking weird it didn't come out. Um, we've also got Deadbolt Films, which is Instagram, and at Deadbolt Films on Twitter as well. Um, and we're on Patreon. Just go to Patreon, type in the podcast on Haunted Hill, um, and you can, if you want to, you can sponsor us um, and fund us on Patreon. Um, as we explained at the beginning of the episode, if it wasn't for our patrons, we wouldn't have been able to get this episode out as quickly as we did only because we had a bit of a mishap and we had to buy some new bits and bobs, equipment and software. Um, so thank you to our patrons. Who, thank you. It really means a lot to us. And as always, our patrons, as we will always name them, are RJ McCready, Lem Yao, Kate Pollock, Rachel Elizabeth, Sarah Kay, Kevin S. Fife, Jamie Jenkins, Jill Smith, 
Matthew Godley and Josh Myers. You guys are all awesome. You're Thank all you legends. So we love much. you very much. Clap, 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 clap. Thank you. Mostly clap, clap, clap. Mm. And we are going to get um, our fourth Patreon episode out very soon. As always, we try and drop one in between each of our main episodes um, where Gav and I will talk shit for a smaller amount of time. And it will only be, it'll be a nice little private conversation for you special Patreon people. So thank you very, very much. Again, if you want to send mm. voice tips and reviews and messages, please, please do. We've got episode 100 coming up. We're really excited. We want to make it a special episode. Please, please, please. I might uh, make a little video of actually because I've been sort of covering like just movies in my collection, weird movies and stuff. I might make a little video of my movies for the patrons. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, also, look, 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 look at my collection. Or... I mean, we've changed it. Like you're going through your um, epi- your um, collection, mm. your VHSs, and I'm doing random things. Where like last time, I just covered off what I'd watched over the last seven days. Mm. Um, I, another time, I talked about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So we're doing different different things. We talked about touch potentially doing a special commentary track if we can get together. Well, I know we talked about doing Beavers and Butthead the movie. We talked about Godzilla today. There's things we could do like that. So yeah. the Patreon episodes will never be quite the same uh, for anyone who wants to become a patron or who, or who is. It's just extra never content. Same really. thing. Yeah, yeah. It's just whatever we fancy chucking out there as a little extra special present for those people that are mad enough to throw money at, at, the, at the podcast really and help us keep it growing and mm. keep it going as a show. Yeah, thank you. So there we go. Makes us feel special. It does. We're special boys. Mm. Right, I need to get out of here. I've literally Me taken too. over Sarah's bedroom. I'm in a bedroom of tarantulas for at least four. I can um, see them. It's disgusting. And uh, I've, I've kicked her out and uh, it's getting late and I should be like... You can have your bedroom back. No problem. Well, I'm going to go and uh, do something in my living room, I expect. Excellent. (laughs) (laughs) Don't need to know. The blob and the stuff. Right, well, we'll see you guys next time for a bit of The Omen and a little bit of uh, Rosemary's Baby. But until then, it's a good night from you. It's a good night from me. It's a good night from Chocolate Chip Charlie. It's a good night from you. And it's a good night from Sigourney Weaver's hair. Brilliant. <laughs> Stay safe, people. Oh, Stay safe. do listen Stay to the Holy Strangeness podcast as well. Oh, yeah, don't forget that. Yeah, I've oh, got terrible, haven't I? Episode 9, Acid Bath Murders. Next time, episode 10, Bigfoot Bummed Me. Anyway, later, people. <laughs> ah, don't just drop it on that one. Yeah, bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon.